يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سلام good day few days ago I got a heads up by Eddie uh, of the Dean Show that my name has been mentioned in Hyde Park Speaker's Corner by a non-Muslim who claims that there are 10 Qur'ans and I was invited to comment on Dean Show on a video of this man speaking to Sneeko, um, an influencer who converted recently to Islam. Uh, but I saw in this man's sincerity from the way he raises the questions. And I invited him to call me if he can so that I can clarify the ambiguity of this topic, which many non-Arab speaking Muslims, not just non-Muslims, don't understand as well, which is the topic of the Qira'at, Ahruf, stuff like that. And here we are tonight. I have Chris of Speaker's Corner. So thank you, Chris, for uh, calling me. And in the beginning, my intention was not to meet with you on camera, just between ourselves, but you chose that this be public. And I am okay with that too, because I am in love with the Qiraat, as I said in on Dean Show. And I, say, and I always say that. I always say even that if I were not a Muslim, and I studied all what I have studied in Islam, probably the Qira'at would be the point that attracts me to embrace Islam. Um, I, and as I, I was uh, telling you before we, uh, we go online that I don't go to Speaker's Corner because I'm not into shouting matches and I only <laughs> uh, participate in civilized discussions where people do not interrupt each other. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself to people who are maybe do, who do not know me. Uh, number one, I am Fadil Sulaiman. I am not a scholar. I'm a student of knowledge. I hold a master's degree in Sharia and I studied the Qira'at and I hold an ijazah, which is a permit to recite and teach the Qira'ah of Warsh with a continuous chain of narration to Prophet Muhammad. Wasallam. But I studied all of the Qira'at. But I didn't have time and energy except to narrate one uh, qira'a, which is Warsh. This uh, will be, inshallah, a civilized discussion where we will ask each other uh, questions and allow each other to answer without interruption. I'm sure Chris understands that raising a misconception or a controversial question is easy, but to answer it properly in a way that does justice to the topic um, it needs time and needs concentration. So I may need some time in some answers. Uh, my intention is not to debate, but to learn. Uh, when, and what, when truth seekers talk, they do not focus on winning, but on finding the truth. And I was telling him, by the way, online, before, uh, uh, before we, we go online, that Imam Shafi'i said, I never debated with someone except if I pray that God makes the truth flow on his tongue. Definitely, it feels good to be right. But when you find that you are wrong, then that means that you learn something new. And I hope that we both learn new things. And the Quran told us to be objective, by the way. There is a chapter called the cave, which Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, asked us to read once a week. I ask myself, why would he ask us to read it regularly like that? Is it for the blessings in it? Well. I don't think so because the whole Quran is a blessing. So if it was about the blessing, he could have told us or commanded us to choose one surah and read it every week. But since he um, assigned a surah particularly, then definitely this means that there are some meanings in this surah that should be renewed in the heart of, of the human being at least once a week. And one of these meanings is objectivity. One has to be objective. Follow the evidence wherever it takes you. The young people who fled their homes to preserve their religion, which is the first uh, story in uh, Surah Al-Kahf or the cave chapter, uh, they, they wanted to avoid persecution and uh, oppression in religion and uh, uh, protect their religion. So they said what? They said, these our people have taken for themselves gods apart from him from god if only they would come forth with a clear manifestation of them what does that mean it means that the quran is telling you if there is 
evidence that proves the genuineness of other gods besides God, go ahead and worship them. So follow the evidence always. This is the objectivity of the Quran. Prophet Muhammad himself was commanded by God in the Quran, in Surah Az-Zukhruf, before meeting with the Christians of Najran, he was told, قُلْ Say, إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَحْمَانِ وَلَدٌ فَأَنَا أَوَلُ الْعَابِدِينَ If the All-Merciful had a child, I would be the first of worshippers. Which means what? I will leave Islam. Because you cannot worship someone else with God. Or you cannot, you cannot say that there is a son of God in Islam. So it means that if, there is, if it's proven that there is a son for God, leave and go there. That's what the Quran itself tells you. So, Chris, I want to welcome you again. And you have the microphone. Please introduce yourself and shoot. Sure thing. Well, I just want to say thank you very much, uh, Fidel, for having me on to uh, to have this chat. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. I'm glad that we could set this up and, and have this and actually uh, and do it. It's it's amazing. I wanted to first say, um, you know, I saw the the video you did on the Dean Show and you said you'd love to speak with me. So I thought, hey, it'd be a great opportunity to reach out to you. I had some Christians uh, and a few Muslims actually message me saying, you should go talk to him. And I was like, yeah, that would be a good idea. Um, I'm obviously someone who is familiar with some of your work, uh, predominantly the ten, uh, the British translation of the Ten Kla'at of the Noble Quran. This is something that I got from your website. Um, I have a PDF copy of it along with the app on my phone, which I often bring to Speaker's Corner. And what I really appreciate about you in particular is you are someone who wasn't afraid to do this, to take the Kala'at and to make English translations because I don't know Arabic. I've, I'm not studying in Arabic at all. So I wouldn't really have uh, an easy access to this if it wasn't for your work. Thanks to your work, I, I can actually easily reference this and say, okay, in one, one reading it has this, one reading it has this. And it makes it clear to, to English native speakers, uh, which has been a big help. So I, thank you very much for that. You're obviously very sincere in your beliefs. You're not afraid of acting on those beliefs and putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak, and uh, following your convictions. And I appreciate that very much about you. And yeah, this this chat, I, I wanted to just go over some things, um, maybe perhaps starting with that clip of me speaking to Sneeko, um, because obviously I had this chat with Sneeko at Speaker's Corner. Uh, you were commenting about it on the Dean Show. And I think maybe just starting there would be a really good place and from that, we can sort of take it further, right? Um, so when I was at Speaker's Corner on March 17th, I happened to bump into Sneeko. Uh, I recognized him because I've seen him online. I've seen the things he's put out regarding Islam because he, he does make some Islamic content now that it has become a, a Muslim roughly about a year ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask him some questions because there's a worrying trend, and I think you may have noticed this as well, uh, Fidel, that there are some Muslims in the Ummah who are not familiar with the other recitations besides Hafs. They have this idea of, I think, what you might call Hafs normativity, that there is just one reading, and it's just this one. It's the one that most Muslims in the world have. About 95% of the Muslims in the world have the Hafs reading, and I've never read or perhaps even aren't even familiar about the different readings that are available, the other nine that are valid by Islamic scholarship. And I mean, it got to the point where I heard people, I heard um, a father tell his son, actually, that there is only one reading of the Quran. There's only one, and it's it's this one. And I thought, well, that's, that's not technically true. I mean, there's meant to be the ten Kla'at, and uh, I wish that that father would tell his son about that one day so he would be knowledgeable in this. Um, I'm for objectivity. I'm for finding the truth, wherever truth leads. I think that's a really important virtue. Uh, and I'm glad you also uh, believe this too, Fidel. I think that's great. We can share common ground there. Um, so from my point of view then, when I was talking to Sneeko, I wanted to make him aware of these different kalat in case he hadn't he hadn't learned about it before. And he said he hadn't heard this before. I want to make the point that I don't, I'm not arguing against preservation as such. I'm not saying that you cannot say the Quran is preserved because of the kalat. That's not my point. I think you can make an argument that the Quran is preserved in very similar ways that you can for the Bible, for example. But I would say that anyone who thinks that the Quran is perfectly preserved, and by that I mean letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot, halakha for halakha, that, that particular perspective I think is flawed. And I think that isn't true. And in the quest for objectivity, you might say, I would like Muslims to know this 
so that they do not repeat this because I think it is an error. And there are scholars who repeat this. Um, Yasser Qadi has made this point, for example, that he thinks the Quran is perfectly preserved. Um, letter for letter, dot for dot. There's some others as well. And I think it's best for the sake of the Ummah and for the sake of that objectivity to clarify this, that you can say the Quran is preserved, but to say that it's perfectly preserved, as in the text is perfectly preserved, I think is an error. Do you want to come back yeah. to that? Okay, Fadal? thank Maybe you. some thoughts on that? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Number one, no, the, the Quran is preserved word for word, letter for letter, not because Muslims did a good job preserving it, but because God did not give the um, responsibility of preserving the Quran to any human being. He said, I am the one who descended a dhikr and I am the one who is preserving it. So he preserved it. Uh, not like other scriptures that, um, for example, we also have a, an ayah in the Quran that says, um, uh, that talks about the rabbis who were uh, supposed to preserve the uh, Torah, uh, which is the book of Moses, but they did not. Um, and the Quran is full of uh, c criticism to their um, ways of changing things in, in, um, in their book. Uh, but what Muslims did, uh, uh, actually, uh, a good job is um, when, when uh, the Quran descended fully and Prophet Muhammad uh, 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 gave it to them uh, very soon after his death, they started collecting the parchments because at that time they, they, it, it wasn't written on a, in a form of a book. But it was on parchments and stuff. They collected it. They did a, com a committee. And uh, they chose a young uh, scholar of the Quran so that he does. he's not stubborn. He is someone who is flexible. And he will be uh, 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 energetic. And this committee collected all the parchments in and made it in a form of a book. And they kept it in the uh, house of Hafsa, one of the mother, uh, mothers of the believers. And um, in the time of the third caliph, when the, um, uh, when the uh, Muslim uh, state became so big and many uh, uh, new areas entered Islam, like uh, Iraq, like uh, the Levant and, and so on, and Egypt. So he wanted to distribute copies. So the same people, okay, by the way, one of those people is my great grandfather. Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam, who is considered one of the four Abduls, or the four biggest scholars of the Quran, called Abdullah ibn Zubair oh, wow. al-Awwam. Yeah, he's my third. <laughs> you actually have like a relation. Yeah, he's, a, he's my 34th grandfather, actually. And uh, so uh, this committee copied the Quran and sent it to the different uh, states at that time. Uh, that's, what, that's the good thing that Muslims did, but... Even if they didn't do that, Allah told us that he is going to preserve the Quran and it is preserved. If people go and change the Quran, it doesn't matter. Still, Allah is preserving it somehow. By the way, it is preserved in the chests of over 9 million children in the world today. They know it by heart. In Hafs narration and in Warsh narration and in many narrations. But the problem here comes when we are in Europe and in... Uh, or in, in places where the Muslims are non-Arab speaking people. And this matter of Qiraat and Ahruf and stuff like that is a linguistic matter. It is very hard to explain it to a non-Arab speaking person. So most of them were not even told about that. And many of them thought that it's only Hafs. And many of them also thought it's only Warsh. And then <laughs> they find that sometimes they read differently. But at the end, it's all from the Quran. And it's, it's, it's an amazing phenomenon in the Quran. Because you know that when, when, when uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the, um, the, the, the polytheists with the Quran, and the Arabs at that time had amazing, uh, uh, amazing um, uh, speakers who give amazing speeches that can move armies 
and people fight each other because of, of, of a fiery speech, or they have also very good poets at, at the same time, amazing poets. And uh, mainly there, they used to contest uh, in, in poetry. And Allah challenged them to bring a Quran like that. They couldn't. They were given a discount. Yeah. Ten surahs. They couldn't. More discount. One surah. They couldn't. But even, you know what? A surah is only like ten words. The issue is, not they did not even dare to accept the challenge. And this is what many people don't understand. The miracle of the Quran is not eloquence. Eloquence is unmeasurable. And God is not going to challenge people with something unmeasurable. They heard something that they couldn't fathom. It is using the same letter set and the same words, but in a very different way. To the extent that if I use this style outside the Quran, it doesn't make any sense. It's even painful on the ear. But if I use it in the Quran, it sounds good and it's acceptable. And I gave a, 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 a I gave an example in the Dean show uh, regarding that. I used one of the ayat of the Quran. And uh, uh, if you want, I can read it also uh, now and read it outside the Quran and inside the Quran and see that it's unfathomable. It's not. It's it's unbearable outside the Quran because this is not how people speak. So the Quran is like a third style. At that time, when the Quran descended, there was only two styles, prose and poetry. Now, Arabic language has three styles, prose, poetry, and Quran. Quran is a unique style. It renewed the, the language. It used forms that never were never used before and cannot be used in poetry or in prose. If not in the Quran, they don't sound good. That's amazing. So that's, that's the issue. It's a linguistic issue, and that's why many non-Arab speaking Muslims did not know. But what I thought, when I, when I, when I came here to, 10 years ago, I thought that, no, it is the right. It's a human right. It is the right of people to know how their Lord spoke. So I believe in something called Tadabbur beyond Arabic. Tabur means pondering, and I believe that the Quran can be pondered even from a good translation. And I started to, I chose the best translation at that time, and I started in East London Mosque pondering surah, one of the surahs, Surah Al-Nur. And I was able to find out what exactly is uh, making, or, 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 or what are the obstacles that are facing the pondering in, in English language. So I decided to make a new translation that respects the style of God in speech. I want to give you another example. And I'm sure if you read my, my book, you have seen that. God spoke about the hereafter over 500 times in the Quran. In past tense. Yeah. Past tense. Well, uh, most trans all translations made it future tense. And when I asked them, why did you do so? They said, what do you want us to do? The English reader will find it awkward. I'm sorry, but even in Arabic, past tense never denotes future. And this made Arabs ponder, why is God speaking like that? And then we found amazing stuff. You know, God has 99 names. One of them is the first. And one of them is the last. He is the first without a beginning. And he is the last without an end. What does that mean? It means that he is not inside time. God is outside time. So the hereafter, judgment day, is a future event, definitely, for me and for Chris and for our audience, but not for God. God doesn't have future. God is outside time. So when he spoke about our future, he spoke in past tense. This is mind-blowing. So this book, this uh, uh, translation, is not only about uh, uh, translating what God meant to say. No, it's also about translating the style of God in speech. Okay, so yeah, I, you raised it quite a lot there. Um, I I <clears throat> definitely agree. Um, that example you used as well. I find that fascinating that he does speak in past tense, meaning the future tense. Uh, I do find that interesting and. Um, and you, you also gave another one in the interview. You talked about how you refused to translate the Arabic ayah for Sion 
to mean verse. You said, no, we, we keep it as ayah, like meaning sign. And that's, a, that's an interesting that point as well. Sin. I think it says sin. Yeah, you said it was a it sin, yeah. Sign. To, I'm sorry to mm. call it verse, because verse is a, a unit of text in poetry. And one of the misconceptions on the Quran is that it is poetry. It's not poetry. So how come you use the word verse for a unit of text of the Quran? Hmm. So what I like as well is you you don't shy away from the idea that in the Qur'at, the 10 um, authentic Qur'at that scholars have affirmed, that they are places in which the meaning is different. So there's also a lot of places where it is just pronunciation. Um, there are a lot of places where it's not really that much of a big deal in terms of how you, how you switch it, but there is places where there is a substantial point in meaning difference. Um, you gave some examples. I mean, in the video with Sneeko, I gave the, the classic one of Salah Fatiha, uh, Maliki and Medin, Maliki and Medin, and that as king and owner, and they're technically two different words, so there is a changing meaning, um, which is something I like about your book because it illustrates this. And again, many Muslims are unaware of this. There are many Muslims that I've spoken to, uh, both online, both uh, my friends, and also mostly a Speaker's Corner, who will say that the killer art is uh, nothing but dialects. It is just purely pronunciation issues. It's uh, potato, potato, you know, tomato, tomato, these kind of words, right? Um, like pants uh, or trousers for the British, you know, these kind of differences. Um, but I think it's important that we do know there is a change in meaning and it is a uh, substantial one because it is a different meaning. And having that readily at our fingertips and being able to show that I think is quite important. Um, so with that being said, I would say that let's let's put it this way. One one of the things you said that, that interested me is you said the aruf is is just dialects. So you made a distinction between the kalaat and the aruf, and you said yes, the kalaat can have its different recitations, and yes, there can be different meanings in some places. The aruf, however, that we know is just, it was revealed in seven different modes or seven different ways. That is just dialects. Um, and then you said it was abrogated by Muhammad. Uh, I'm interesting. Did did you misspeak when you said it was abrogated by Muhammad, or or was that your actual position? You think the Arif was abrogated by Muhammad? Good. Okay. Yeah. Would you like me to, to respond now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, well, you raised two different things: Ahruf and Qur'at, and those are two separate things, completely separate. And I'll tell you why. If we have Ten Qur'an, because one of the things you said in uh, to Sneeko is that there is ten Qur'ans. Because there is ten Qur'at. Well, let me give you more than that. Every Qari gave two narrators, two different narrators. So, for example, Hafs took from Asim. So the Qari is Asim. That's the Qari. And he, he has two main students, Asim and Shu'bah. Nafi' has two other students. Warsh and Qaloon. Warsh is very close to Shu'bah and Asim. And Qaloon and Nafi' is very close to Hafs and Asim. So for your info, the 10 Qurra, the 10 Qaris had about 20 narrators. So you could have told him there is 20 Qurans also, by the way, but there isn't. There's only one Quran that is that encloses these uh, qiraat which 30 percent of its variations are not performance they affect the meaning so much meanings become completely different but not one contradiction between any of them and uh that's that's very important but let me let me continue okay so this is very important so when we say that we have 10 qiraat or 20 narrations for the quran this doesn't mean that we have 10 or 20 qurans we have one that the mean because if an ayah has two different qiraat or three different qiraat some ayat some ayat which is the maximum can have Four different qiraat in one ayah. In one ayah. And I'll, I can give you an example, by the way. This means that the meaning of the ayah is the collective meaning of the four qiraat together. 
And when you put them, it's like putting layers of meanings above each other that become clearer and clearer until the ayah become vivid, become so it's like high, high, uh, high, uh, how do you call this? Uh, high definition. Um, for example, we know that uh, Pharaoh told his assistants that he will kill Moses. So he told them, let me kill Moses, which means start uh, spreading the word that so that the public would accept the atrocities that he will do. And then the ayah ended and the surah ended without him killing Moses. But no, nothing tells us why didn't he kill Moses, as he said. The Qira'at tells us. Because he said, ذروني أقتل موسى إني أخاف أن يبدل دينكم أو أن يظهر في الأرض الفساد Let me kill Moses I'm afraid that he will change your religion uh, or he will uh, make mischief appear on earth There's another قراءة and he will make mischief appear on earth There's another قراءة I'm afraid that he will change your religion or mischief will appear on earth but not necessarily from Moses. And the fourth Qira'ah, I'm afraid that he will change your religion and mischief will appear on earth instead of or. So this means what? That when he said so, that was a long meeting with his assistants and they studied every single alternative or every single probability that can happen because of killing Moses and they came up to... Uh, uh, to a, to a decision that, no, this man should be debated in public, not killed, not made martyr. You understand me? So this is the beauty of the Qira'at. It's like the ayah starts moving, you see, is in, or, and, and you can see that with a change of a diacritic mark or a hamza or stuff like that, you saved adding a whole page to the Qur'an and instead of be, being concise and, uh, and um, uh, able to be uh, uh, memorized easily and stuff, it becomes too long and too, or maybe boring. You understand me? So this is when it's about the Qur'an. But the Ahruf is something different. When I said that the Ahruf are dialects, that's the opinion that I adopt. There are many opinions about the Ahruf. And this can be also a misconception. Why Muslims don't know what the Ahruf are? Anything abrogated, you will not find Muslims knowing what it is. Because it's abrogated. And I will, I will explain this to you now. But, uh, <clears throat> because the concept of abrogation is also a huge concept, by the way. But the Ahruf, there is uh, several, maybe about 20 opinions about it. Maybe the most sounding opinions is the one that I said. It's dialects. And there's another one which is synonyms. Like, come here in Arabic can be halumma or ta'ala or aqbil. All of these are Arabic words that are used today. You know, if I tell someone in Egypt, halumma, what's going to happen? If the whole street will fall on its back, cracking. What is this guy saying? He speaks like Iraqis. You understand me? So it's like, it's unacceptable. We don't use that. We use Ta'ala. We don't use Haluma, but Haluma is used in a neighboring country. That's what the Arab world is not a one homogeneous when it comes to the language. No. So one of the also, one of the uh, uh, opinions is that it's synonyms like that. The hadith is very clear. And I have the hadith, I think I have the hadith ready to show it to you and to the people um, because it's very important to show them uh, this hadith. Um, Bismillah. Yeah, if, if you have it. Yes, 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 I have, it. I have it. I will, I was, I'm bringing it. I'm bringing it. I was wondering on. as well, could you give me, uh, uh, Could you, if I want to show something, could I bring it up as well? If that's good. Sure. How can we do that? Do, can you add something? I don't um, think the guest I can, can, I can But tell me what it is. I can it do is. it here and you have to bring it up. Really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh. You know the bottom of the screen? It'll appear at the bottom of the screen and then you click on it and it will come up on the screen. Oh, that's, per that's very good. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. Let me now first show the uh, this. Why is it showing? Oh. Subhanallah. So you, you go to present and then you find uh, yes, what it is you yes, want to present. Yes. And then is it at the bottom? And you have to click on it to bring it up. 
Okay, I should remove this from the studio and add this. I have to add this to the studio. How do they add this to the studio? Oh. You should click on it. Yeah, I'm doing that, but new layout. Maybe, yeah, new layout, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, not the layouts. Um, so you see, you see what I am at the bottom of the screen, hopefully? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's actually better. I think this is probably a good Ah, maybe I should <laughs> nice, remove nice you layout. to bring it first. One moment. Okay, one moment. Uh, let me see what I can do here. Strange, man. One moment. Uh, roof. Subhanallah. Um, um, oh, that's very strange. Um, um, it was working, and I tried it before we start. Uh, there must be a way to present. So if you're doing hadith, if you tell me the hadith, and if it's something I can find yes. easily, I could find it and then present it for you. You know, it's, it's very, uh, it's the hadith uh, about the ahruf. Um, yep. let, me, let me see what I can do. Let me see what I can do. Because I have it here in the studio, but it's not adding. Previous slide. Mm. One moment. Just give me a second, guys. SubhanAllah, share screen, oh, video, slides. So, okay, what do you want? I have it here also. Share screen. No, no, but I can, uh, yeah, I don't, no, no, it's, it's not a share screen. I don't know how to, um, I, no, I can share screen, but I don't have it actually. Uh, yeah, maybe I can oh, do that. Okay. One moment, one moment. Maybe I can do share screen then. Um, I just have to bring the hadith itself. It's called Ahruf here, okay. Okay, okay. Now let me do share screen now. Oh. Share screen. Uh, okay, well, this will be hectic every time, but anyway. Uh, where's the... No, uh... A window, okay, here, here, uh, share. Yeah, can you see this, guys? Uh, the hadith, it, uh, I hope it appears, huh? Does it no, appear? No, 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 yeah. You may, you may have added it. Is it at the bottom of your screen now? No, I just said the screen. I said now I said stop sharing. No, we don't see it, yeah. It's not at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Um... Let me see with the comments. Uh, can't you see it? Can't you see it? You can send them a link, brother. Okay. Okay. I, I would just read the hadith then. Okay. Let me read the hadith and, 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 and tell you what it says. Uh, it's narrated by Ubay ibn Ka'b and it's a hadith sahih, which means it's an authentic hadith. The messenger of Allah met Jibreel and said, Oh, Jibreel, I have been sent to an illiterate nation. Among whom are the elderly woman, the old man, the boy and the girl, and the man who cannot read a book at all. He said, oh Muhammad, indeed, Quran was revealed in seven ahruf. So don't worry. In another narration, he added, every harf is shaf in kaf, healing and sufficient. This is very important. Every harf of them is healing and sufficient, which means that uh, it means that any half of them is the Quran. You understand me? That's why I'm saying that the Qiraat existed in every half as well. And it's Prophet Muhammad who was worried that it would the Quran would not be acceptable by uh, would not be accepted by the um, less educated people in the different tribes of Arabia, especially that Arabs are sometimes too bigoted against each other. And uh, by the time before he died, he because he used to uh, present the whole Quran for Jibril once a year in Ramadan. The last year he presented it twice in the presence of 
the scholars of the Quran among the Sahaba, among the companions. And he presented it twice in one harf, harf Quraysh. So he is the one who asked for more ahruf. And be, before his death, he abrogated six of them because it's not needed. Because the, or the, the, the hadith says every harf is kaf and shaf is sufficient. So every harf of them is the Quran. Understand me? Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. It was, whether it's dialect, whether it's synonyms, the one of Quraysh is acceptable by everyone because actually maybe the Prophet ﷺ was too worried. But Quraysh was always accepted by all the tribes in Arabia because they were the custodians of the Kaaba. And even before Islam, those people did not consider themselves pagans. They didn't say we're pagans, but they used to claim that they are following Ibrahim, uh, 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 Prophet Ibrahim. But they were actually worshipping idols as well. But they had Hajj. They had pilgrimage to Mecca. So still, Quraysh was very uh, respectable. And the Prophet saw that he doesn't need it anymore. He abrogated six. And there only stayed one harf with all the Quran. So j just to add to this, um, well, to challenge it maybe, because Do I, I would wonder, where are you getting the idea that he abrogated it from in this in the surah? Because as far as I understand, there isn't a part of the sunnah that explicitly mentions that Muhammad abrogated the Aruf. No, is it, no, is it no, no. Because, it hmm. is said that the Prophet ﷺ presented the Quran twice for Jibreel and in yeah. one harf. It was in one harf. He did not present it in Does he say that explicitly? Does he say I, only in one half? Definitely in Harf Quraysh. It is there in Harf Quraysh. I, I just have to search and find it for you, but it's in Harf Quraysh. One half. It actually says that in the it actually says that in the hadith or the narration. Yeah, I, I will find it for you, but not now. Now, now, now I don't have it in mind, oh, okay. but but anyway, hmm. the, the, the same sahaba who attended the last presentation are the same sahaba who collected it after a few weeks, a few weeks in Harf Quraysh. That's it. Okay, yeah, I guess that raises the question as to what was the intended purpose from Allah of revealing the Quran in seven different modes if it will be abrogated in such a short period of time. To make it easy I mean, for it, people, to make it easy for people, and but the right, end, so, at the end, Allah knows everything. Allah knows that it's going to be abrogated. So for Allah, that's not a problem. It's only that it was a worry that the Prophet worried about, and he himself didn't worry about it anymore. It's acceptable. Quran is flowing easily. Many people mm. became memorizers. That's fine. We don't, he doesn't need that anymore. And okay, I'm so gonna, even I, if the yeah, tell me. Just, just to say, if the Aruf is is just dialects or is synonyms, it is still a recitation from from Muhammad who got it from Jibril who gets it from Allah. Yes, of course. And my understanding would be that the companions would not leave things that they were told with Quran, as, as you said. All this Aruf is Quran. Every half is Quran. So would the companions, why would they have abandoned this? It, it seems as if they wouldn't Exactly. The, uh, the companions would never do something like that except if the Prophet did it himself or allowed it. The companions were even afraid of collecting the Quran in a form of a book because he didn't command it. And then they, they, they used their intellect and they said, no, this is, much, this is definitely better. And they, they took the decision. So uh, do you think that people were afraid just to collect it in a form of a book would, would take their, 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 their decision to remove six? Why remove them? Why not keep them all? Well, you see, what I've been reading from scholars uh, like Dr. Yasser Qadi is that there is a debate over the Aruf and whether or not the Aruf is still around today. There's a question over what the Aruf is, and there are different opinions. Uh, you know, Dr. Yasser Qadi gives 12 of them, and he highlights three of them as being good contenders for what Aruf is. Uh, one is dialects, although he admits it's difficult because dialects to whom? Like you got the Quraysh, you may have uh, like a tribe in Yemen, but there's Tamim no scholarly and, consensus. Yeah, all those, yeah. And they speak very differently. Yeah, there's, mm, there's, there's no consensus over which seven tribes this is referring to. Um, so for that reason, it, it, it seems odd that, for example, the oral tradition wouldn't preserve that knowledge. Why would the companions not know if this was dialects into which tribe, why would that not be preserved? Why would that not be Because it's abrogated. In the Anything abrogated. I mean, well, okay, in the Quran, there is something called abrogation. Yeah. Abrogation can be verbal abrogation or meaning abrogation. For example, the uh, the the uh, the uh, 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 alcohol, wine. 
was made haram, was made uh, prohibited gradually. So there are uh, signs in the Quran that tell us uh, that not to drink uh, uh, much before, uh, not, not to drink before uh, praying. Yeah. Uh, this, that, this, this is there, but it's not valid anymore because it's abrogated, but the ayah is still there to show us that when you do something, you should do it gradually, especially things that are rooted in the society and stuff like that. But there's another way, another thing, which is called verbal abrogation, that an ayah could be there and then it is abrogated verbally, which means the, 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 the words itself vanish. Even though this is called inset. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, illa ma sha Allah. We will uh, make you recite in a way that you do not forget except what Allah wants you to forget. Which means Allah can make the Prophet forget and everyone forget and the ayah vanishes. So when we say that six ahruf vanished, abrogated verbally, it means vanished. So you see, the Sahaba themselves are even trying to remember what exactly was it. It's gone. It's gone. And this is there also in some uh, ayats. Well, well, the, Omar said, I, I, am, I am sure definitely that stoning was in the Quran. But he doesn't remember the ayah. And no one remembers the ayah. And they started like to, trying to come up with things that actually sounded funny. Like, as shaykh was shaykh. That's not Quran. You understand me? So this is the issue. When something is abrogated verbally, it vanishes. So, my, so I'm really intrigued as to whether there is an authentic sunnah that explicitly says um, there is only the, the aruf is now to be abrogated. There is only one half. It is the one of the Quraysh, and that is it. Um, I'll be really interested if you could show me that because yeah, as far as I'm aware, I, I haven't I, seen I can this. Check that. I can check but if that. You can, if you could show me or give me a reference, that would be amazing. Um, and the other point is, is even, even if this is the case, I would still argue that from a merely a scholarly perspective, perfect preservation cannot be true. Because if you've got six out of seven, and these are all Quran, this is all authentic Quran, there is no distinguishing between any of them, although you, maybe you'd say the, the Hafs of the Quraysh is better or something, but they're all Quran, and if they're all now gone, when they were actually in use, they had been recited from the Prophet, then effectively you have six out of seven different modes of the Quran lost. No, because we don't know lost. where they are today. No, not lost. Well, they were not. No, no, no. Only one of them is enough because that's what the hadith says. Uh, كلها, منها شاف كاف. Any one of them is sufficient. But the Qiraat, not one is sufficient. You have to, add, to, to collect all the Qiraat in order to understand the whole meaning of the ayah, if the ayah has different qiraat. This is, okay. that's what I'm telling you, the qiraat has nothing, is that completely different topic from the ahruf. And the main misconception happens when people mix them together. Okay, so how I would see that is, I think the, the majority position, as far as I've been told, maybe you can correct me, is that scholars tend to make some relation between the alu with the seven different modes of recitation and the kilaat, because otherwise it's very difficult to understand why there is kilaat, why there is these different modes of reading, why there is 10 of them, for example. Because as far as I'm aware, there is no sunnah where, the, where Muhammad says, there is such a thing as kilaat, you are to read it in this many of them. My understanding is when he talks about the recitation and how he gives it, he talks about Aruf and he says the seven of them and they are all Quran. But there's nothing like that for the Qur'at. So by making them related, you can have an argument that is, okay, well, because the Qur'at comes on the Aruf, there is some relation there. We can say that Muhammad told us that this would be the case. And therefore we can say, ah, so we know it is Sunnah, it comes from Muhammad. But because so that are... isn't there then you can't argue it sooner. I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Has lost it. I'm, I'm trying to understand so, what you're saying. So are you saying that hmm. there is no evidence that the Prophet read with Qiraat? There is no. There is nothing in the Sunnah that talks about 10 Qiraat. Is that correct? No, of course, there's a lot in the Sunnah. How did we? Re how did the Qur'an reach us? Actually, it's through narration, and there's a, a lot of hadith. One of them is a hadith narrated by Lady Aisha in Jami' al-Tirmidhi, 
she said sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yaqra'uha faruhun wa rayhan i heard the prophet peace be upon him reciting it faruhun instead of farauhun wa rayhan and that's a completely different meaning because the first one is farauhun wa rayhan means serenity and fragrant uh, plants the second one is a soul with fragrant plants so and there's a lot of ahadith actually if you open the books of sunnah you will find chapters called qiraat which is like giving us the dalil the evidence on on these qiraat how come you say so no of course not of course not but just just to say you, you gave evidences of different readings and different parts absolutely I, i'm aware that it mentions these things but there isn't anything where muhammad says explicitly like he does with the Araf. the quran is revealed in in 10 different Qur'at, and this is how you are to take the Qur'an from me. He was teaching the Qur'an like and people were reading it. Why does he need to say that? He is already, we he, all, this, is, this is well known and people are reading it. But, well, first of all, the 10 doesn't come until much later, right? So there seems to have been, at least in the early Ummah, the early period, Tabi'un uh, Tabi'in, they seem to have this understanding that there's actually more Qur'at, there is more readings. So yeah, example, I'll tell you why. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the problem now. The problem is uh, there is a variation in the way we read a certain ayah. Okay? This is a variation that was, was there and people were reading it and were well know, were, were knowing well about it. But later on, people started to make this a science and to categorize it and, may, and give every qira'a a name and the name of the best reciter who recites it. So it was known later on like that. Like for example, saying King James Bible. Does it mean that it is the Bible that was sent by King James? Of course not, you understand me? So that's the issue. But the prophet didn't say that, and I'm telling you, they are, it's, it's like thousands of variations. Variations are a lot, about 4,500 or something like that, or variations. But to categorize them in 10 qira'a, that this came later, but before, the variations were there, people were reciting them and were very well aware about them. Definitely. So, I mean, I guess I guess this makes it difficult for me because if <clears throat> I wanted to say the Qur'at come from Muhammad and Muhammad made it clear that th there is these different readings, I would go to the Aruf to explain that because that's clear. He's, you know, it gives an example. You know, you have um, Umar bin al-Qutab and... Um, Hisham bin Hakim, I think his name is. Yeah, yeah, You have them yeah. in a just about Al, Al uh, Farkan, uh, so twenty-five, yeah. and he they brings him to the prophet, and he says, "Recite your way, and I'll recite my way." And the, and mm. Muhammad says, "This is correct, and this is correct." The Quran is revealed in seven out of seven ways, and they're all Quran. Yeah, but there is nothing like that that gives you that kind of confirmation from the point of view of the Sunnah about the established ten Qur'at. and that's and if you don't make the the relation no, between the no, 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 wait, wait, wait. If, if, even, if, you, can, even, if you can bring... Hmm. Even this hadith that you mentioned doesn't say seven, seven ahruf. It says it was revealed like that and it was revealed like that. Okay? Even this one about, about Umar ibn Khattab and Hisham ibn Hakim, it says it was revealed like that and it was revealed like that. It doesn't say what exactly. Okay? It, it does but, say seven, actually. No, um, no. I'm this looking one, at it now. I can bring one, it up on the screen if you want. The Prophet. It's, yeah. it's not by the Prophet. Not by the Prophet. Um, well, it was narrated by Umar bin al Qutab. This is in, let me tell you, Sahih Abu Khali 4992. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to bring it up? At the bottom, it says, yeah, yeah. Uh, This Quran has been reve uh, revealed to be recited in seven different ways. Actually, you know what? Maybe maybe it's not in Arabic. We, we the bring same, this up the same Arabic. thing. So. That's Omar saying so. But the Prophet did not say in seven. Um, at the bottom of your screen, do you see uh, like a new thing that looks like Sunnah.com. If you could bring yes, that up, then I yes. could oh, yeah. There you go. Hey, there we go. I yeah. don't know why this doesn't work for you though. That's, yeah. that's a shame. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so yeah. this is this is what I'm referring to here. If yeah, read it then. Read it then. Read the first. Okay, so narrated Umar bin Al-Qutab. I heard Hisham bin Hakim reciting Surah al fuqan during the lifetime of Allah's Messenger. And I listened to his recitation and noticed that he recited in seven different ways, which Allah's Messenger had not taught me. I mean, we can go on. He also says seven at the bottom as well. But do you want to say my point? He yeah, yeah, but, but, but yeah, yeah. the Prophet himself okay, in well, a actually, different seven hadith, more, but it means seven. seven. Yeah, the Prophet yeah. himself said seven in a different hadith, which I recited. But in this one, the Prophet just told them it was revealed this way and it was revealed that way. That's it. 
okay, okay. but it okay. affirms yes. seven. Is it what was I'm saying. revealed so, this way. The Quran has been revealed to be recited in seven different ways. Okay, perfect, good. So yeah. the Prophet yeah. mentioned that there are seven different ways to yes. recite. Good. And yeah. this is our oath, and they are they, they are yeah. all correct. It's all good for you to do so. And you know, maybe one half is is equivalent. You only need one half. You know that absolutely fine with yeah, that okay. as well. But yeah, okay. they are different, and they are all recitation of the Quran. So yeah. to lose them is to lose six out of seven, or roughly about eight. No, continue the, the hadith. Continue. He said, read in any one of them, the one that is easy for you. So it is a ruqsa. It is something to make recitation easy. Different from the qira'at. The qira'at are carrying different meanings. This is not carrying different meanings. That's why I'm is telling you. That's why I am for the, the, the I am, I am, I support the opinion that says it was dialects. Okay. I, okay. Or, or even well, it's synonyms, but it, it it's carrying the same meanings. So, are you aware of the hadith where it talks? Uh, actually, no. Sorry, it, it is this hadith. Um, these two people, Umar bin Al Khattab and uh, Hashim bin Hakim, they are from the same tribe of Quraysh. Is that correct? Yes, of course. So, if they're from the same tribe of Quraysh, how can it be a difference in dialect? Amazing. Remember that hadith that I told you. The Prophet was worried about who. The old woman, the old man, the little boy, the little girl, and the man who is unlearned and never read a book before. Neither Umar al Khattab nor Hisham ibn Hakim fall into these categories. I am now talking to you in English, though I'm not an Englishman. Why? Because I know English and I love to speak in English. Sometimes I speak with my children in English. I love English, but I'm not English. So same thing. If there are Sahaba who are masters, mastering the science of the Quran, and they know the Ahruf, why don't they get train themselves on it and recite with it in their Salah? And, and, and because they're going to teach it to the other tribes. Okay, but they're from the same tribe, right? So I don't think this would be an issue of dialect. So whatever they're arguing about, and remember, he, he considers this very severe. He drags him by the neck, I think it says. This is very serious. When he, and he yeah. even says, what was the sora you were saying? Now, he thinks it's a al he can, he can He can understand enough of it to know what he's trying to say. But the way he phrases it is, what is this sora you are saying? So he yeah, thinks yeah. there's a difference here. Yeah, because um, Omar was not aware is, about that yet. But Hisham was a younger man, yes. and he was given this because he, he's, he's going to teach. So yeah, he is he 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 would like to train himself on the other dialects too. Uh, by the way, sometimes I speak in a Lebanese dialect. I like that, just because I visited Lebanon several times. That's it. But I love it. So doesn't mean that, I think this that, is. Yeah, hmm. I, I was good. just saying. I think this is good reason to think this isn't just dialects. If this was dialects, I don't think this this would be the response they would have. Um, again, they're from the same tribe. Whatever so it was. It's a bit, Whatever it was, like if I was from Liverpool and you were from Liverpool, we were both speaking a Scouts accent, right? So dialects wouldn't be the issue. We would both have the same terms for the same things. Speaking even the accents down to the way we speak would be the same. So whatever this issue they have, it must be more substantial than just dialects. And and that for me is sufficient enough to say that a roof is not not just dialects. It's it's something more than than dialects. No, it's it's uh, anyway it's dialects or synonyms or whatever. If I know a different way to recite, why don't I recite it and get trained on it? That, that's it, whatever it was. So the Prophet was worried about categories of people that he will only teach them this so that they don't get confused. But this doesn't, doesn't, and Hisham ibn Hakim does not fall into these categories. Anyway, I don't want also to the listeners to think that, that, that we're only like, uh, uh, discussing controversial things. There are also things that I think you loved in the Quran. Did you read anything that you like in the Quran? Did I read anything that I liked in the Quran? Um, yeah. there, there were parts that I, I thought were, were good. I, there were parts. I have read the Quran uh, from Salah Fatah to Surah Al Nas. Like, the really? It's amazing. Good. Yeah, I have. Yeah. The same with the Bible. It, it took me about Three to four months, I think, to read really the Quran. Oh, I was reading it on a train. <laughs> but um ah. yeah, uh let me let me the, let the, me the ask you something. Though. Let me ask you, let me ask you. I I have some because I want to show people that we can also have commonalities, and there are things that are inspiring about God. For example, God is described in Surah Al Buruj, and he is the oft forgiving, most loving. Do you agree with that? 
So I, I've got to be honest with you. I would say no, because in other places, I believe in Surah 33, it talks about how Allah does not love the disbelievers. So if he was all loving, from a, from a Christian perspective, yeah. this is just what Christians yeah. would say. We would say that God loves even the sinners. He hates okay. the sin, but he loves the sinners. So as someone who does not... Um, does not subject themselves to the law of Christ, does not follow the Messiah, which is what we Christians do. We would say that God does not like that, but he still loves you. And he yeah, still no, I'm asking you, you about, do you, do you agree with the concept that God is forgiving? And like, okay, let's move oh, to another one. For example, indeed, yeah. God is all powerful over everything. Do you believe that God yeah. is all powerful and he can do everything? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, well, that's, that's, that's actually clarifying. That's what I want to show people because... that we can agree on things that are also matters of aqidah. For example, Inna Allah alimu ghayb al-samawati wal-ard, innahu alimun bi-dhati sudur Indeed, Allah, or God, of course, the word Allah means God. I just want the audience to know that. Uh, let me let me show something. I have a, a, a nice picture here, and I want to show it to them. Um... Uh, about the uh, Arabic Christian Bible here. Guys, this is the first page of the Arabic Christian Bible. This word, at means Genesis. And the word Allah is the one highlighted. So in the Arabic Christian Bible, in the first paragraph of Genesis, the word Allah exists five times. In the same page, in the first page, 17 times. All through the Bible, it exists Thousands of times. I have a friend, a Christian Egyptian friend called Majdi Abdullah, the servant of Allah. So when I say Allah, please, if you're not a Muslim, don't you ever think that I mean anyone else. I mean God, the same God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus. Uh, anyway, so there is also this uh, uh, ayah that also I want to. Oh, it worked now. What? Yeah. Um, yeah, here. Indeed, Allah is the knower of, of the hidden realm of the heavens and the earth. Indeed, he is all-knowing of what lies within the chests. Do you, as a Christian, or as Chris of Speaker's Corner, agree that Allah is all-knowing, that he knows everything? Yes, yes, we do, but, yeah. Perfect. But also this one. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. And he is all-high. The great. People can be great, but not the great. When we say the, something that's only God. So he is the greatest. No one can be greater than him. Do you agree with that on that? Yep, we agree on that, yeah. Perfect, perfect. That's, we, there's I, a I lot of commonality. Yeah. Yeah, by all means, there, there is a lot of commonality between our, between good, our religions. Good, I good, would good. say that fundamentally there are differences, and, it, and it's these yeah. things, of course. Of course there is. Of course there is. We... we we always have uh, we always have things that we like to discuss, um, of, course. of course. But we do so respectfully, yeah, yeah, and uh, we make sure that we we don't raise our voices. You know, yeah, you know, as, as we're both we're both being uh, really. I would never do that. Person, actually, person. I, I I never do that. And I think you your personality is not that. That's why actually I invited you to speak with me. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, thank you. So, I, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Go ahead. To, continue if you have, if you have um, more if you have more examples. To yeah. Give me. Examples, you mean uh, like uh, related to the arts and things like this? or do you Yeah, mean... well, I, I said that there is no uh, contradictions, for example. Do you think there are contradictions? Because you read the whole oh, okay. well, read this my is, book. Well, this is interesting because in Surah Anissa, Ayah 82, I believe the Arabic says that if this this was not <clears throat> from, uh, from Allah, there would surely be many contradictions. Yeah. So the Quran seemingly doesn't have a problem with the singular. It doesn't have an issue with a contradiction. It has an issue with many contradictions. Would that be fair? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. No. Had this I mean, been, the Arabic says plural. Hmm. Yeah. Had this been not from Allah, there would have been many contradictions. Because no one can write a book like that and not have many contradictions. But in this one, there is not one contradiction. Show me contradictions. So, well, we could get into this. I'm, I'm not a fan of contradictions because I don't think they... The, the, the people can give theological context and explanations to solve these things. And again, if the Quran seemingly doesn't have an issue with like one or two contradictions, I don't see why that wouldn't also be applied to the the Bible, uh, well, the Injil or the Torah or the Zabur. If the, if it's if that's the ruling for the Quran, it seems like that should also be ruling for the previous scriptures. 
Um, so the issue I have is is false false things. That would be my my main issue uh, with the Quran. I think there are things in it that are patently false, and that would be my problem. Um, we could go into big topics here, and I kind of want to avoid it because if we start going down this, Please. we're going to go into very big things. Go ahead. Go so ahead, one go would ahead. be. Um, so, for example, uh, I think that the Quran makes it very clear that it affirms the teachings of the Injil and the Torah. And I think it's quite clear that if you think that it does, then that must be an error because the Injil and the Torah teach things that, well, they go against what the Quran says. So the Quran is making a falsehood here. It is affirming something that it doesn't quite know. So it's saying, we affirm the Injil, we affirm the Torah. But then it also says in Surah Anisa, 157, that Christ was not crucified. It only appeared to them as if he, as if he had been uh, crucified. But again, the angel says he was crucified. So that to me is is wrong. Um, that's a that's a classic example, I think, from the Christian perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We okay. we don't we wouldn't know how to reconcile that, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, okay. do you have any point to that? Or yeah, yeah, of course I have. I have a lot actually to say about that. <laughs> Just sure. Yeah, I imagine you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we as Muslims believe that there is only one God. And there's only one humankind. So there's only one sender and only one recipient receiving. And this means that definitely he's not going to send different messages to confuse people. He's going to send the same message, which is worship God alone and do not associate any partners with him. But he sent it through ages with different messengers. And in many books, all of them are the books of Islam and all of them are the messengers of Islam. So the founder of Islam is not Prophet Muhammad. The founder of Islam is Allah. Muhammad is merely the final messenger of Islam. And the one before him was called Jesus, son of Mary, which is very accurate, son of Mary. And the one before him was Moses. And the one before him was Abraham. And the one before him was Noah and so on. So one God, one humankind, one religion, not religions with an S, one religion. And this religion has to be suitable for all people in all times. It has to be suitable for the Arab and the non-Arab, the white and the black, the man and the woman, the tall and the short and the fat and the thin. So only one thing is suitable for all those. And it's this. Water. Not tea and not coffee. Why? Because some people don't drink tea, some people, but everyone drinks water because water is pure. It doesn't have a color. It doesn't taste sweet or sour and it doesn't smell anything even a good smell even a good scent so islam is not called after someone christianity after christ buddhism after buddha judaism after judas and and judah uh, and and uh, hinduism after Hind india islam is just means to submit to god to obey god that's it we are not called muhammadans and it offends muslims when they are called muhammadans though they love him so much because they are not Muhammadis, they are Muslims like him, and like Jesus, and like Moses, and like Abraham, and like all of those. So that's the issue. We believe in the Torah and in the gospel given to Moses and given to Jesus. But not the one written by Mark. Not the one, Mark who? People at that time were called Mark, son of so, John, son of so. But Mark, John, Matthew, Matthew who? You have to listen to Bart Ehrman. You, not only Bart Ehrman, because he left Christianity. So here there will be maybe a, a, a bit of a, a, a conflict of interest. But even Bible scholars themselves disputed about the authors of the Bible, of the Gospels. And, and there are things that, that were uh, very confusing. And by the way, there are things. The, the Quran says that it is the reference. Whatever the Quran will agree with in the Bible, then it's it's perfect. It's good. For example, Edonai Elohimo Edonai Achad. Your Lord uh, is uh, 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 your God. Your Lord is one. Kul hu Allahu Ahad. Perfect. That's perfect. And this is definitely genuine. But there are other things that we definitely believe they were added. And it's not necessarily bad things. Not necessarily embarrassing things. But when someone writes, bring me my coat, which I forgot in Carpus's house. In a book called the letter of Paul to someone. This is just a friendly message reminding him to bring him something. Why are Bible scholars insisting that every single letter is the word of the Holy Ghost? 
come on. This is really too much. And I'm not talking about other things that you know that I can talk about. There are things that are, you understand, uh, rated R. And I don't want to go through this because you will have your own interpretation. And I don't want to go through this. But the issue is, no, we agree that and we believe in the books that were given to the prophets. But the it is, uh, let me tell you this, in its original language, this is not the Quran. This is Father Solomon's translation, Bridges' translation, Father and Hala's translation, but not the Quran. The Quran is only the one in Arabic. Bring me the one in, uh, in Aramaic. That is not a translation because we know that whenever we translate, there is something lost in translation. Where is the original? That's the issue. Well, people, uh, uh, when they talk about the preservation of the Quran, they criticize Uthman ibn Affan for burning the Masahif. You did not bring that. I'm bringing it. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. No. So just to, just to go through some things because you you mentioned quite a lot here. So yeah, um, we do know about the <laughs> the evangelists. We know their names. We we know who their their fathers were. Uh, Matthew, for example, is Levi Levi ben uh, Altheus, for example. Uh, we have Cephas, yeah. which is Mark's name. We know when they were born, when they when they uh, likely where they died. We know what they did. We know Matthew was a publican. We know these things about them. Um, the idea that we don't know anything about them is just because a lot of people don't bother to look into it. But our traditions in the church tell us quite clearly who they are, were and what they did. Um, so that is kind of a bit not not really applicable here. Um, the scholars, the Bart Ehrman thing, like you don't know who these were. Well, this is based on something like formal anonymity. This is a concept where you have in the Gospels, they don't ever technically say um, who is writing them. So, for example, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, there isn't something that says, hi, my name is Mark. I am writing this. You won't find that. In the same way that you won't find that in any of the surahs of the Quran, there is never a, a bit where it says, I am Muhammad and I am telling you this. I am I am writing this. It, you won't find that in the Quran. Never. Now, that's you will cool. find even, like, can I cut you here? Uh, just, uh, yeah. Hmm. He actually said, Qul, say he is Allah the one. Qul Allahu ah. He didn't say he is Allah the one. He said, say. So even the command say, he mentioned it to this level right. of accuracy. Yeah, but you understand my point, right? That Muhammad is never explicitly introducing himself saying, I am the one who is like telling you this, that I got this from Jibril from Allah. You won't find that in the surahs. In fact, Muhammad is mentioned somewhere between four or five times explicitly by name, depending on whether or not you accept Ahmed as a, as a, as a variant name for Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Jesus is mentioned more, uh, as in Isa is mentioned more. Um, Moses is Musa is so on. So from that point of view, anonymity isn't really a thing. The church knew exactly who was writing these because there's never been any issues within the church giving particular uh, authorship to these books. The, it's always been the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's never been any contention. No one ever argued about it. Um, which, no, there's again, a lot of Islam argument. Is... There is a lot of argument mm -hmm. within the Bible scholars about the, the personalities that wrote this. Okay, I'll ask you something. Who wrote the books of Moses? Sure. Who are the book? You mean the Torah? Yes. So who are the who are the Torah? Well, yeah, you who say the, the classical Torah? Torah. The, there is a critical scholarly opinion which may say, yeah. well, actually, maybe it wasn't all done by Moses, maybe it was done by later authors. There is that perspective. You could say, well, actually, it was revealed by and written by Moses, who um potentially didn't do the last parts of Deuteronomy because that includes his death, and it seems to make yeah. more sense that he wouldn't write about his own death. Yeah. And so perhaps it was Joshua that added that part. Um, or Why you could say, say that? it was. So it's not the word of God. Mm -hmm. Joshua was not receiving revelation from God. So this means that the parts of the Bible are not God's revelation. Uh, by the way, see, apart if from you the wanna... gospel, mm -hmm. Mark, Mark, the last twelve verses in Mark sure. are. Um, you know, we have we have a very famous monk, a beautiful one, who died lately in Egypt. His name is uh, Father uh, Matt. Uh, Al Miskin here, this beautiful man, he has a whole a whole exegesis of the Bible. When he came to the last twelve verses of Mark, he said, "I'm not gonna waste my ink or the time of the reader in uh, explaining them because they have nothing to do with Revelation." 
Why is that? Sure. Because when it was collected, the masahif were not burned. Uthman burned them after collecting, after distributing. He collected everything that was written in the presence of the Prophet because some of them were adding their own uh, understanding, adding some explanation said by the Prophet, adding things. And there were no biomarkers. There were no red uh, pens and blue pens and stuff like that. So by time, things got mixed up. And Bart Ehrman also said the same thing. Probably it was, it was something that was written by the uh, students of the, of the author. So it was added. That's the problem. When you are collecting something and you collected it and you are sure of it, tell people anything that you have, bring it. And this is not, it's going to be confiscated because we are afraid that this can get mixed up by time. That's the issue. Right. Well, I think it's problematic when we talk about the tradition, as you rightly pointed out in Sahih al-Bukhali 4986 and 4987, where Uthman is said to burn Quranic materials. Now, scholarly speaking, we don't know what those materials are. We, we have no way of going back in time and seeing exactly what it is that he burned. Um, I think that's difficult if you hold... No, we know, no, we know what he burned. No, no, I'm sorry. We know what he burned, and Abdullah bin Mas'ud was so sad for burning his notes. These are called masahif. Masahif means, the word mushaf means notes. Every one of them had his own notes that he wrote in it. Quran wrote many things in it. So if it's only Quran, Abdullah Mas'ud wouldn't worry because halas, the Quran is collected and it's being distributed. But he was sad because there's a lot of knowledge that he wrote in it. You're right, but Ibn Mas'ud... This knowledge does not get mixed up with the word of God later on. Ibn Masud disagreed with the Uthmanic Codex initially. Yes, yeah. this, this, I mean there is even narrations where Ibn Masud tells his students um, th there's a there is an ayah in the Quran that talks about how you should bury things because uh, what you bury with you will be revealed with you on the day of judgment or something like that. I'm paraphrasing, and he actually quotes that when talking about his Musaf. He's saying we have our Codex here in Kufa, and we are saying he's telling his uh, disciples, his students, to bury them because. Uthman is saying we need these materials to destroy them. And I mean, there's Shia narrations that talk about pretty horrible things happen, happening to Abdullah ibn Masud by Uthman. There's a narration of um, ibn Masud, I know you probably want to accept this, but it is there in history uh, as, as, a, as a report where Abdullah ibn Masud goes down to, to Uthman, I think in Medina, I believe, and he enters into his uh, madrasa or um, a masjid and Uthman sees him and he says something like um, something really bad has just entered. And they get people to beat him, according to the story, simply because Ibn Masud is rejecting the Uthmanic Codex. Now, we know scholarly-wise, the, uh, the Abdullah Ibn Masud Codex survives for many years after 652, 656, when the Uthmanic recension occurred. So there is a large amount of Ummah in Kufa, at least, or in modern-day Iraq, that preserved his reading. And his reading is not Uthmanic. His reading differs on these points. And what's interesting is when you look at Fiqh, you look at um, uh, you look at one of the schools of, of Fiqh, they actually know in Surah Al-Maida, I, uh, I think it's uh, 86, but I'll find it for you. There's a variant in the Ibn Masud Codex that talks about how when you break an oath, it says that you are to feed, I think it's like 10 hungry people, or you are to clothe them, or you are to free a slave. And if you cannot do this, then you are to fast for three days. But in Abdullah ibn Masud's codex, he has an extra word. He has the word consecutively. Yeah. So yeah, one yeah. of the schools are thick. Yeah. Uh, it's not Hanbali. It's it's not Maliki. It's not Safi. It's um, Adopted. the other one. It, it, <laughs> yes, we, they, they, and they actually, and that's why in their school of fiqh, they actually tell people, if you do this and you break your oath and you can't do this and you have to fast for three days, do it consecutively. Excellent. That's excellent. Because we are wanna... aware. And yeah, it's, it's, so, so this is interesting because if you hold the idea that the Quran is perfectly preserved in terms of a text, then how on earth in Islam do we have verdicts of Sharia, how you apply the Sharia, that look to non Uthmanic readings? And apply them as authoritative. These are called qira'at tafsiriya. These are called a tafsiri qira'a, an explanatory qira'a, where he says three days consecutively. Consecutively is a word that he is explaining, but by time thing, people thought that that's a qira'a of the Quran. That's why it's unaccepted. And when because it's not proven, so it is 
called Qira'a Shadda, a, uh, uh, an awkward Qira'a that is, that can be used in fiqh. So some people can use it in fiqh, which is in, in verdicts, but not in recitation during salah. If you read it in salah, your salah is invalid. So that's the issue. Right, but Ibn Masud did consider this as part of his codex. No, he said, no, because, no, he's again, he's sticked... Ibn Mas'ud submitted and gave his mushaf to be burned and it was burned. But his qira'ah is there. People know it. People know it. Right. But we, we have uh, reports that these things are still being used. There are Islamic historians who are still mentioning that they come across the codex of Ibn Mas'ud and it's still being used. This is this yeah. is different. I mean, again, this this wouldn't surprise us because remember the the seven kilaat that we that was a, um, established by Ibn Mujahid in the tenth century. I mean, there was other kilaat that was in use, right? Yes, there was other kilaat that did not and follow the rules. Three others Mujahid qualified place. lately by Al Jazri. Three others yes. qualified. Yes. So there are ten uh, uh, acceptable kilaat that uh, are qualified to be the kilaat, but the others are called kilaat shadda which does does not uh, match or does not qualify to be Quran. But still, we can co consider them like the Hadith Da'if. We can take them in fiqh. We can use them in... Because it's actually... It mean, mainly it's explanatory. It's Qur'an Tafsiriya. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I find this difficult. I, yeah. I wouldn't okay. think that this meant perfect preservation, right? This seems to me to be a kind of preservation, but it's not perfect preservation. So, for example, how do, how do we know that there wasn't Qur'at that uh, was actually valid? The only way we would know this is if Muhammad said an authentic sunnah and told us about it. But because that isn't there, we have to rely on later scholars like Ibn Mujahid to basically tell us. Ibn Mujahid is like, okay, I'm going to standardize it at seven. Here are the seven. And that was very contentious. There were tons of Islamic scholars that were like, whoa, 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 why, why are you rejecting this? Why are you rejecting this? And even Ibn Mujahid, actually, there's material that says he critiqued the very kalaat he picked, he said, this kalaat has this reading, it is wrong. This kalaat has this reading, it is wrong. And that comes from Ibn Mujahid, who standardized the readings. It looks to me as if what has happened is, over time, the Uthmanic Codex had standardized the reading in Arazm, that did <clears> not have the diacritical marks, that was sent out to the different cities, and they were sent out with two imams who were there to, to explain how this should be read in that particular Musaf. We know that the Uthmanic codices were different when they sent out to these two, uh, different cities. And when they were at these places and they were reading into it, they were reading from their own native tongue. So in other words, they added their own influence to it. So when they added the diacritical marks, they may have got things slightly different from how other readers would have. They can do that. They that, can do that. Mm. Uh, just a diacritical mark, a wrong diacritical mark would change the meaning upside down. You can't imagine. It can turn the subject into the object and the object into the subject. I think you have seen are... that in, in my book. So exactly, a wrong right? so... critical mark would be like a, 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 a bomb. People will not accept it. People, people are aware and people are memorizers of the Quran. No way. But, but it's quite easy to do this, right? So if we look at uh, Malachi and Medin, right? What is the difference there when it comes to uh, the Walsh uh, Qur'at? Like in terms of the actual text, I could be wrong about this, but is it not just an alif? Like yeah. the, there are obviously, I mean, that seems pretty simple to make a mistake. And, and when you're copying it, you, you add an alif. The alif is a vowel which was not even, which was not in the rhythm before. The alif was added later to the Arabic language, but it was a vowel. That was only a sign before uh, above the above the, uh, the 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 meme, but originally it can it can be written Malik and a, a small alif above the meme, and it's there until today in some masahif. So you read it Malik Yawmiddin. This is how it's written because the alif is a vowel, and the wow and the ya. Sometimes they do not even they are not written. It's, 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 it's vowels are different. Like also in the Hebrew, they have the dagesh and stuff that are added above and under the, 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 the word. But the, here the problem, the importance is why is it Malik and Malik Yawmiddin? And which one of them is the Quran? Both of them are the Quran. One of them says that God is the owner. And the other one says that God is the king because not every king is an owner and not every owner is a king. That's the issue. 
So God is the king and the owner. We live in a country sure. where the king doesn't even rule. <laughs> I think you can resolve a lot of these by by combining the meanings. I do think that that is a valid way of looking at this as a, as a way of solving this theologically. I think that is fair. I think there are readings that are that are contradictory, though. That um, isn't. So, for example, so if I gave you one, yeah, please we look at it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to quote. Can I share my screen if that's all right? Yeah, go ahead. Just because it because I'm quoting a particular scholar. So, when I, when uh, I which one? Because I, um, I have also some here. Maybe, maybe uh, I have it here also. Which one? So, can you see my screen? I think you might have to bring it up actually. Yes. Um, there we go. It. Ah, thank you very much. There we go. So let me take a look. Okay, so this is uh, Marin van Putten. I believe you you quoted yeah. him. Uh, yeah, I know. On your, on your I know. Podcast. It's a friend, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'd love to meet him. Um, I know, he's yeah. obviously a very good scholar. Know. So he basically points out that the story of Lot is repeated in the Quran in, in many different places, and he gives the different verses. Mm -hmm. And he, he says, okay, so there are parallels in Genesis 19, which is where we have it in our, in our scripture. And he has this thread here, and he says, it's been noted that a pivotal moment in the original story about Lot's wife is told quite differently in the Quran than how it is in Genesis. Fine. In Genesis, as uh, Lot and his family leave Sodom and Gomorrah, his wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. That's what we have in uh, in the Bible. In the Quran, the pillar of salt is missing entirely. Yeah, that's fine. And generally, it's not the wife looking back that causes her perdition. Instead, she is said to be left behind or even decreed to be left behind. And it gives some verses here. But 1181 forms a confounding factor. And he has some screenshots of the different verses. So we can say, except his wife, we are allowed to decreed that she is one of those who remain behind. Okay, so she remains behind. So we saved him and his family, except for his wife. We destined her to be of those who remain behind. So again, Lot's wife is not going with them as they leave. She is staying behind, except an old woman, i.e. his wife, among those who remained with the evildoers, staying behind. And this one as well, except an old woman among those who remained behind. So the Quran is clear in many places that Lot's wife stayed behind. Now, what he goes on to explain is that there is a particular one, which is Surah 11, I 81. There is a variant here, and you include it in your book, by the way. Um, it's written there as well. Here two angels come to warn Lot and command him to leave uh, his family and not turn around. After that, a phrase follows, which can be read in two different ways. And he gives it in Arabic. I'm not even going to pretend I can pronounce that well. Both mean accept your wife, but what is being accepted differs. The section consists of three phrases. So travel with your family during a portion of the night and let among you not one turn around, except your wife. Illa, except in positive sentences, is followed by the executive, uh, accusative, again, I'm not going to pronounce that, they prostrated except for a bliss. So he gives an example. But when accepting a negative sentence, it shows up in the normative, as in this, there is no God but Allah. So with this phrase, it accepts the, uh, it accepts, ex except, sorry, the positive phrase, so travel with your family except your wife, this is the majority reading. And then it gives two kala'at, read it, uh, according to the, the um, rawiya, uh, illa, and then it goes on to say it, accepting the negative phrase, and not one of you shall turn around, except your wife. And then he says, clearly these two readings are difficult to unify. Either the wife did not travel along and stayed behind, or she went along and looked back. I have to. I, I, you have to tell me which ayah is it because I have to bring it in Arabic and judge. Oh, I'm not sure. going to judge. I cannot judge from translations. Translations at the end are a waste of exegesis. So when I translate, I'm explaining my own understanding. So the 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 the, 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 the most important is or what distinguishes is the Arabic. So tell me, tell me, tell me which uh, which surah and which ayah. So surah eleven, ayah eighty one. Okay, Surah, so, Surah, uh, Surah Hud. Hud must be Surah uh, Hud. Yeah. Um, yeah. Surah 11, uh, 81. Yep, yep. Okay. Let me just double check. I'm pretty sure that's right. Okay. Was it because. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Bismillah, I'm bringing it. No worries. Now, this is you, Yes. So if if Marin is correct here, we would say that this is a reading that seems to be saying two different things that can't both be the case. This is not going to happen, never. But let me see. Okay. Yeah, 81. Yeah. 
قالوا يا لوط ان رسل ربك لن يصلوا اليك فاسر باهلك بقطع من الليل ولا يلتفت منكم احد الا امراتك انه مصيبها ما اصابهم ان موعدهم الصبح اليس الصبح بقريب اوكي okay. uh, how did i translate this uh, let me check it in my translation uh, بسم الله uh, uh-huh. Surat Hud 81 here. They said, Oh Lord, we are the messengers of your Lord. They will not reach you. So take your family on a journey while yet a part of the night remains. And let none of you look back. But not your wife. She will be afflicted by that which afflicts them. It means that take your family, but you don't take your wife. If she wants to remain, let her remain. All right. So what Marina is saying is that there are two ways you can look at this based on yeah. the different uh, these two colors. You can either yeah. say, except your wife is in the the center. Hang on, let me go to let me look at this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I show the same also. I show the same in the footnote that and let none of them look back except for your wife. Here means that. If she insists, let her look. Halas, you, you can't do anything for her. But this one says, if she insists to stay, let her stay. So here, it's the angels are commanding Lut on what to do in the future, and they are telling him if she wants to remain, let her remain, and because she is destined to be with them, and to be to 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 uh, to be afflicted. And if she uh, insists to, if she goes out with you and she insists to look back, let her look back. She is at the end going to be afflicted. Beautiful. I don't see contradictions. So let's, let's read what uh, Marin says here. So he says, so travel with your family, except your wife. This is the majority reading. So the majority yeah. reading is that go with your family, Lot, but not your wife. Your wife mm-hmm. is going to stay behind. Mm-hmm. And other Quranic verses, remember, there were quite a few other Quran verses that make it clear. And there is, to my knowledge, no Quran on them. It simply says that she stayed, but she also was killed. No, so, no. no, no. The, yeah. It means she was with them. At the end, she ended up, she ended up like them. Whether she stayed yeah. or she was punished. Because at the end, she did not leave the, the village. By the time they were about to leave the village... Or by the time they just left the village, the punishment happened, which is like, it is, it is by the way, discovered lately by NASA that it was like a meteor that exploded uh, about four kilometers above the, the, the earth in that area. And those who looked, probably that's what the scientists say, lost their sight before dying. So that's, subhanAllah, this is very yani, yani, very accurate from the Quran that you have to be behind your family to make sure that no one looks. But if the wife looked, she's gone with them. If she stayed, she's gone with them. We, we don't necessarily know. And by the way, the Quran not all, doesn't always give full details 100% and he leaves things for the mind to think about. The Quran, by the way, is a sure. book of guidance. It is not a book of history. It is not a registrar that registered history details at all. I agree, but it does make historical claims, and we would assume that those are true, which I think is fair. We both agree there. So the issue here is that the majority reading says quite clearly that she did not go, and that's backed up by other Quran verses that have no Qur'at variant that also say she did not go. But then there is Qur'at on this verse where it says... And none of you shall turn around except your wife. In other words, the the but your wife part, the except your wife part, is being applied to those who turned around, not those who went. So in other words, this the negative, the minor reading is saying she did go, and then she looked around, and therefore she perished. Presumably, we have we have to check the tafsirs and see what does it mean fil ghabirin fil ghabirin that she did not really go. By the way, and this is one of the meanings of this ayah that she did not even go. Okay. Or does it mean that she is considered one of their group? So even if she leaves, she's going to be punished outside the village. I don't see contradiction, by the way. It just doesn't. The contradiction would be: Did she leave? It doesn't tell us exactly what happened, because here it's the the, angels hmm. are commanding him on what to do in the future. It's not the angels that are reciting something or telling him an, uh, 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 
an event that happened in the past. I, I agree. This is talking future tense. It's explaining what will happen. Yes. But is it saying that she will go and turn back or will she stay and turn back? And the reason why this, I think this is quite powerful and difficult is because there are other verses in the Quran that are clear, much clearer that say she did not go. So how can there be a Qur'at reading that suggests not, that she did go? Not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that she did not go. It means that she is among this group that stayed. She is among the group that will be afflicted like that, which is the group of the villagers, the, the rest of the people. But not necessarily that she, that, that she will leave or not. So the issue is here that this, uh, this ayah does not even contradict that because one of their meanings is she may want to stay, let her stay, and she may want to go, and she wants to, she will want to look back, let her look back. She is in any way going to be punished like them. I don't see a contradiction still. Do you uh, have another well, this example color, that's clearer than this? Because this is not clear. Uh, the contradiction is not clear. Well, see, these are the Quran verses, right? Except his wife, we decree that she is one of those who remained behind. Okay, so this verse is saying she remained behind quite clearly. So we saved him and his family, except for his wife. We destined her to be of those who remained behind. Again, very clear, she remains behind. Except an old woman, his wife, among those who remained. So she again remained. Except an old woman, among those who remained behind. And she remained. So these then she remained. Things... Good. Okay, then, but there is a the verses... that says that she did not because she turned around. She went with them and she turned around. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The one that okay. says that she may go and want to look around speaking about something in the future but the others are speaking about things that happened that she remained and she remained okay for, i don't think we're, we're going to agree on this one um, yeah we're not we going to agree on that definitely yeah but, but yeah yeah, but, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, give me another example where it's like more uh, clearer than this that there's a contradiction there's no contradiction okay there. okay like i can do that um so if we go to surah uh, yunus uh surah 10 i uh 16. yeah I think I have it here. Um, what does it say? What does Van Putin actually goes on to say that Abdullah Ibn Masud didn't even have this as part of his codex, by the way, in regards to the. Uh, what does it say? Well, what does, what does the Unit 16 say? <laughs> um, no, not this one. Okay, let's remove this one. Okay, Unit 16. You know, 16, uh, not this one too. Um, okay. I don't know how to remove this from the to the remove. Um, you know, 16. Um, yeah. I have it somewhere here. Yeah. Um, here, here, here. You know, 16. What, what does it say? Can you say the ayah? Um, uh, yeah, let me just, um, Bring it up from my my stuff, uh, and then I'll quote it to you. I think I have this it's here. So <clears throat> the ayah says, here. "Had yes. had Allah yeah. willed, I would not have mm -hmm. read it to you, and He would not have informed you about it." Mm -hmm. And then it goes on. But the here. variant says, "And He would have informed you about it." So it's a it's a literal negation. It's it, one saying something will, and one saying something isn't. No, it doesn't say that. Listen to me. And I have it on the screen now, by the way. Yeah. Uh, stay. Had Allah willed, which means that it's going to speak about something that did not happen. I would not have read it to you, which is the Quran, and he would not have informed you about it. That's one. Yeah. The second one is, had Allah willed, which is something also that did not happen, I would not have read it to you and he would have informed you about it, which means through someone else. Somehow else. Somehow, like for example, here the prophet is saying, had Allah willed, neither he could have sent me as a prophet, nor even you were made aware of the Quran at all. Or, 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 he, he neither sends me as a prophet and he can make you aware of it. By the way, Allah could have sent the Quran to each one of us by revelation. Couldn't every one of us 
have got in touch with Jibreel and receive it like the Prophet ﷺ. But it would be too hard for us to do that. We were, The Prophet was suffering when he was receiving the Quran and then he calls for the uh, scribes and then he recites what he received. So here it is talking about two things. And you know what? I didn't like that when you read the second variation, you did not continue what I wrote, which is through someone else. Because like that's that in the Arabic reading, though. No, 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 no. You are reading it. No, 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 no. But the, here, it, this is explanatory. It explains and says that Allah either could have sent, not sent me as a prophet, nor made you aware of the Quran at all, or Allah could have not sent me as a prophet and still made you aware of the Quran because he can, he is indeed all powerful and he can do everything. But it's a blessing that he chose me and made me suffer in receiving it because it was downloaded on the prophet's heart. And then the prophet uh, uh, propagated it to us. So that's the blessing here. I don't see any contradiction between them. I guess, I guess this has a historical context, right? This is referring to a conversation that happened. So either Muhammad was told to say, well, <clears throat> I, guess, I guess I have an issue with Muhammad saying two contradictory things. He, if he meant to say that these are both true, in a sense, it would make more sense that he would just say that. Here he's basically saying, I'm revealing this, this, uh, this ayah in one way. I'm going to reveal it in another way that technically says... The opposite. No, the opposite. Not the opposite. Another option. Well, okay, there it might be opposite. another option, but, but the option is the opposite. It's not the opposite. So, so if I were to if I were to ask Muhammad, um, you know, had Allah willed, you would not have um Muhammad would not have read it to you. But would would Allah have informed them about it? He would have had to tell me both yes and no. If I'm and talking about a past event, if I'm talking about a past event, then this would be a, a, a contradiction. But if I'm talking about a hypothetical event, and I, I tell you, I, I, I if I'm taking you somewhere to to, for example, if I'm taking my child, my 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 son to school, and I tell him, by the way, I could have been taking you now to somewhere else, like a nightclub. Or I could have been taking you somewhere else like an archery club. There is no contradiction. I'm telling him about two things that did not happen. But the, the example here, it would be, you could say that to your son, but you could have also apparently said, did you know I could be take, I could not be taking you to the archery club? Yeah. That, Which what, is what just like, what? <laughs> That's It's the opposite in meaning. So could he have taken him to the archery club or could he not have taken him to the archery club? No, 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 no. Here he is saying, the, the case is, Prophet uh, Allah chose a person, a good man, and sent him the revelation, and he and told him to propagate it. Okay, like he did always in every era. Jesus was given the gospel, told him to propagate it, and Jesus himself said that in the by in the in the in the Bible that exists in the hands of the Christians today. Says, I don't make up things. Whatever I hear, I say. That's exactly what the Prophet Muhammad did, what Moses did on everything. But here the Prophet is telling them, and Allah is commanding him to tell them, there could have been two other scenarios. Allah could have not sent me and still made you aware of it somehow else because he's, he can do everything. Or Allah could have not sent me and even let you left you ignorant of it and not know anything. But thank God, he didn't do any of those two scenarios because both of them are not good. There is no contradiction. It's speaking about hypothetical things that did not happen. How can they contradict? They did not even happen at all. I think this is a. I think this is difficult. You will never, um, you will never this, find any contradiction in the Quran. Well, I, I think can't. these are contradictions. I mean, um, oh, no. if you oh, okay. if you think of it in the literal sense of so you're saying one thing and then you negate it in the same oh. verse. I think that's difficult. Ah, come on. And again, ah. I, don't, I don't think you can you can't say that the, the Quran is preserved. I think you still can. I think you just can't say the Quran has been perfectly preserved. preserved. It's, it's God who preserved it. Thank God that he did not let us preserve it. But you see, uh, th that's, that's difficult. If Allah is the one who preserves his book, which th there's a there's ayah that says this, um, then why is Ibn Mujahid the one who standardizes what's acceptable Quran and what is not? No, but they were he did not invent them. 
they were there. But he told but he people chose not, them. Yeah, he yeah because he they needed to be standardized. It's uh, the 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 numbers of Muslims are growing. People are learning from each other, and there are definitely some ignorant people teaching. Until today, there are ignorant people teaching here and there, and we need to stop them by standardizing things, issuing books, telling people not to hear to ignorant people. That's not, that's different. That's normal. That's normal. It's a scholarship. Right, but you see, what perfect preservation would mean is that there is one recitation that has been accepted by everyone, and everyone uses that recitation. That's what perfect would mean here. But because that's not what happened historically, and in fact there was at least 25 different Qur'at that was in use, so you would have had imams giving, leading Salah, giving this their understanding of the Qur'at, which would have been incorrect according to the scholars later on, Maybe Mujahid came and he said, no, this isn't correct, these are the ones that are correct. And then there were scholars that disagreed with him. And even he said there are issues with these recitations. And I can show you, I can show you uh, Marine Van Putin quoting that as well. It, it becomes difficult to see how this isn't just later scholars picking which recitations of the Quran they want and which ones they don't want. And this is why I said it's very important to me that in the Sunnah, if you can find something that says, I am reciting to you the Quran that I got from Jibril, who got from Allah, this, there are 10 recitations, take them from me, and, and say them, but anything else, no. If you could show me that, I'll, I'll no, no, concede no, no. and I'll say, no, no, yeah, no, no. Muhammad says never so. said 10 recitations. It's we canonize, we canonize them in 10 recitations, but there are many, many, uh, well, there's 4,000 variations, okay? Some imams chose to read these with these, with these, with these, okay? But some others chose other choices, but the variations are there. And it is known that even in the Salah, if you read every ayah in a different uh, qira'ah, that's still acceptable because you did not make a mistake. You did not make a mistake. As long as you're reading according to a qira'ah that descended from seven heavens, from above seven heavens. Because at the end, the ayah as a whole has to be read in the same qira'ah. Because it, as I told you, I gave you examples that the the, uh, the 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 whole meaning will be both together. I have actually, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, here this this one. Okay, <laughs> this is another one. I, I yeah, out. this is yeah. because I, I heard you in one of your. I today I watched a video for you in which you criticized this one. This is an amazing one. Yes, this is an amazing. It's a mind blowing. This one says in Surah Al-Safat. Okay, you want to comment on it? Go ahead and say what you have. Okay, so these, these verses are not the same. They talk about different subjects, and they also talk about different actions. So my point is, is that you can reconcile this and say they're doing both. I think that is a theological way you can do that. Um, but I think that there is differences in the verses, and these are different meanings. Of course. Of course. That's, that's, the, so, what, that's I mean, what I love about the Qur'an, is the different meanings. In the same word, let me explain this to you, Chris. Believe me, I love you so much. And I really, really wish that one day I'll be giving you shahada, if not at the end of this presentation, inshallah. Anyway, listen, listen. Bal ajibta wa yaskharun. The other qira, bal ajibtu wa yaskharun. Completely different. Bal ajibta anta. Bal ajibta means you were amazed. Bal ajibtu means ana. I am amazed. But why didn't I translate it as I am amazed? Because that's God speaking. And amazement entails ignorance of something that happened. So what is amazement? That you are, there is something that you didn't know about. And then when you knew about it and you found it big, that's amazement. God, there is nothing that God doesn't know, but he can find something big. But it's something that he knows. So here is, they are ridiculing the Quran. And this amazed Prophet Muhammad, because he didn't know that they are going to be that bold to do something that bad and big. So he was amazed. But for Allah, ajibtu means that this is not going to pass without a punishment. This, I took a note of it. I, I, I strongly took a note of it. So that's why we change this in the translation. But in Arabic, 
It's just a diacritic, one diacritic mark. Fatha became Dhamma. But it changed yeah. the subject. Yeah, it changed. And look the at, meaning look at of the... this ayah, let me just finish this. The meaning of this mm. ayah is neither one. It's both together combined. They ridiculed. I, I understand. And you were, yeah, they ridiculed. And you were amazed. And I strongly took note of it. Or I gravely noted this ridicule, which means I'm going to punish them. And there is no way that they can be forgiven. That's it. Because the one I who ridiculed, me, I, the word mm. of God is really doing a great yeah. sin. So given that these the content of these is so radically different, given quite a small change to diacritical marks, to me this looks like someone has made a small error and produced something. No. 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 Thing here. And even if I would have accepted this is just complementary, uh, complementary you can combine these. That's why I there is a chain of narration. I have a chain of narration in my recitation. So everyone mm. in my recitation is a man that is known for being a scholar of Quran who, uh, whom his, uh, his student recited the whole Quran for him. I stayed for more than two years waiting for my turn every day for about two hours to recite my portion to my sheikh. And he corrects me. And any mistake I do, next day I have to come and recite it properly. And then I start again. So there is a chain of narration for every one of these. Oh, yeah. I, I'm aware that they, they say that uh, and they usually say there has to be at least two for each each killer at. But when it comes to this here, this to me is perfectly sensible to say there is two two recitations. Two, and I would say, therefore, there is variants. These are variants. And there is, therefore, two Qurans being shown here. One Quran that has the same ayah in the same surah saying one thing. And one Quran mm -hmm. saying in the same surah in the same ayah saying a different thing. That no. talks about a different person doing a different action. No, 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 no. I, I give my explanation, and it's clear that the okay. Quran is a third style of language, which is a uh, the same wording can have layers of the meaning. So the whole meaning of this ayah is both meanings combined. Okay. I think that's a good theological explanation. I don't think it works for everything. And I think yeah. mine is perhaps the one that... Um, Look at this. Look at Might this. be more scholarly at this point. Look at this. This is at. this is another example also, which is I think in Surah Shara. Yes, Surah Shara. It says, "وَإِنَّهُ لَا تَنْزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَى قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْذِرِينَ." And most surely, it is a bestowal from on high from the Lord of all realms. So, the, because this Quran is not like any book, it's not written in this world for the world to read it. This Quran descended above the world from outside the world for the world to read it that's big and it says the trustworthy spirit it means jibreel huh? came down with it there's another qira'ah instead of nazala bihi ruh al amin it is nazala you see the difference here in the second letter of the first uh, of the first uh, yeah. uh, verb and a ruha the diacritic mark of the last word instead of Aruhu, which means that Jibreel now became the object. And Allah is now in the ayah and he is the subject that descended Jibreel with the Quran. So the first one says Jibreel is the subject who took the Quran and came down with it. The second one says Allah sent Jibreel with the Quran. Why did Allah say so? Here, let me let me let us show people what uh, what this ayah means. The trustworthy spirit came down with it. The second Quran says he with a capital H, Allah bestowed the trustworthy spirit with it from on high. Why? It's because that one of the alternatives of the Quran. There are only four alternatives from the Quran. Either the Quran is a revelation from God. Or the Quran is authored by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Or the Quran is authored by someone and the Prophet took it from him and said that it's from God. Or the Quran is a revelation, but not from God, from Satan. And that's what the same surah is saying. And in no way have the devils been descending with it. So what happened then? What happened is Allah bestowed the angel, Jibreel, who is trustworthy with the Quran from on high. And this is mentioned beautifully by only changing the diacritic marks in this, 
in, in these two words. That's what I'm telling you. It's mind-blowing. But it's hard to explain it to a non-Arab speaking person. But it's I guess, I guess as well, for, for us, we would just say this is a variant. That's that's how we would approach this in biblical scholarship. It is a variant. We had two manuscripts. I, I, I'm, I agree. It is a variant, it, definitely. Um, I don't think there is a, a basis in Sunnah that this goes back to Muhammad. No, the the, the, the Isnads, the, the, if you can show me, again, you show me Sahih, um, at least by one scholar of, of good reputation, who says that there is a narration that says that Muhammad revealed the Quran in 10 Qur'at, 10 different readings, then it's I will accept it. It's not 10. In, there are several ways, several readings, and then it was canonized in 10, 10 main readings. Canonized. But then it's then it's men it's man canonizing it. That's, that's no, the yeah, of course, yeah, of course. We men canonized it. Men canonized it. By the way, I want to tell you more than this. Well, the order of the surahs, there is a dispute among the scholars. Is it uh, 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 the Sahaba who took the decision to order the surahs like that, or is it from yeah. Allah? The stronger decision that is from Allah. That's why when Zaid. At the oh, time yeah, of okay. Uthman did to the uh, copy of Abu Bakr is that he reordered the surahs according to the last presentation because Abu Bakr was focused on collecting everything and not missing anything. But he was not focusing on their order. The order was made at the time of Uthman according to the last presentation. But I'm not shy yeah. of telling you. I'm not shy of telling you that some scholars say no. It's a decision of the companions. Yeah, well, I heard it was the majority opinion that it was Ijma, that it was a mix. It was it was partly the Prophet and it was partly the companions that came up with this order. Because the Prophet says in, in Sahih narration that, so uh, Surah Tawbah, and I think it's the, the, the Surah before it, Surah 8, he, the, the, the Tawbah precedes Surah 8. Tawbah is number 9, yeah. mentioned explicitly. Yeah, so yeah. it's because it's mentioned explicitly, they go, ah, this one comes after this one. So there are uh, narrations you can take where Muhammad does order things, right? But he doesn't order all things in narrations. And so uh, what I thought was the uh, majority opinion, at least Dr. Yasakali seems to be of the, of the opinion that it is, is that there was an ijma. There was an ijma that formed, that gave that consensus uh, a little later on, which is, which is interesting. Um, I, I, there is a point you did make, um, perhaps it was in the video, um, that I, I do take uh, a disagreement with. You said that everything was written down um, at the time when Muhammad died. Um, I, I don't think that's true. I, I would, if you can show me uh, again uh, an authentic narration where that is said, everything is written down. Then I'll take that. But it seems to me, based on a certain hadith, that there was partial writings and there was also partial memorizers, because the way that um, Abu Bakr with Zayb bin Tabit, when they were collecting the Quran two years after Muhammad died, it says that they took those who had memorized parts of the Quran or memorized some of it, or maybe even whole supposedly, but they also took the written materials. So they, they used both. And the fact that they used both tells me that they could not rely on either alone. They could not get, for example, they could not just get some of the, the Sahaba who are, who are Hafiz, they, they memorized the Quran, they could get them in a room and they could say, right, recite Surah Fatiha, recite Surah Bakra, and go through the whole thing. And Zayd bin Tabir and Abu Bakr and his scribes could be there writing it down. <coughs> that, that didn't happen according to the narration. Instead, they got some people who had memorized it and some written materials, whether on palm, trees, uh, bones, leaves, all these things. And again, the material type tells us this is more note form. So, and given that these are things are being collected and used, it seems to suggest that it was not fully. I love your questions. Your questions are beautiful and are oh, amazing. You. Yeah, really. Now we have memorizers who memorize the Quran, and we have parchments. So the parchments, every parchment had. To have to qualify, there must be two witnesses who witness that it was written in the presence of the Prophet, except one ayah that had only one witness, but that witness was commended by the Prophet for being extremely trustworthy, and he is equal to two witnesses. That was amazing. Those characters too. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the written things uh are a confirmation that that's exactly word for word what was revealed. But it does not confirm 
that this is the whole Quran. Here comes the memorization role. The memorization says, guys, there must be an ayah missing. Where is this ayah? If does someone has it at home? You understand me? So the memorization of the Quran guards the or confirms that everything that was revealed from the first letter in Al-Fatiha to the last letter in Surah An-Nas is there. But the written things confirm that that's exactly what was revealed and written in the presence of Prophet Muhammad. I hope this is clear. Or this is also not convincing. Yeah. Well, it, I think you're kind of making my point, which is that you have the memorizers, right? So if the Quran has all these memorizers, you would simply ask them. what You would put them all in a room, ask them to recite the Quran, and you would have a team of scribes write it down. The fact that they mention written materials... And it sounds like partial written materials. None of these are complete Qurans. They're just little pieces of things that people have found. And remember, there was no diacritical marks here, so they would have just been the continental loism. That, to me, tells me that the Quran had not been written down at this point. Instead, what's happening is they're saying, okay, I mean, this will explain why Zayd bin Tabit, I think it's Zayd bin Tabit, he says, it would be easier, when he's talking to Abu Bakr, it would be easier if you told me to move a mountain than to do some things that Muhammad did not do which is to collect all of the Quran and to yeah, write it down. He was afraid of doing something new because they were so afraid of doing something that the Prophet didn't do. But but it was written in the presence of the Prophet and it is known that there were 48 scribes of Prophet Muhammad. Whenever he's receiving revelation, he would tell them, call Ali quickly, call Muawiyah, call anyone. Any one of those 48 scribes who are learned. And, and anyway, I wanted to finish your question because actually I have a question for you too. Are you only sure, the one? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah? Well, what you say? You want me to finish my point? What, what are you yeah, saying? finish your point. Well, my yeah. point. My point basically is that I, I disagreed with you when you said the Quran has been written down by the time of his death. Oh, I don't think yeah, it had been. Yeah, I think Abu Bakr led a committee to get the parts that were written down, get those who had memorized either large parts or maybe even the whole mm -hmm. of it, and he got them into a room and he combined them. Um, I think that's. I think that's, and that's why you had the first copy, right? The first copy is uh, is Abu Bakr's, the first uh, recension, the first writing down of the Quran. Yeah, a committee what, did that. Did this collection. And did it by the by the cooperation of all the Sahaba and everyone who had a parchment in his house brought it and two witnesses witnessed that that was written in the presence of the Prophet. What's what's strange in this? I'm just saying that it looks as if they had to rely on oral um, oral testimony from the Sahaba that had memorized it. They didn't rely on books. They didn't. They didn't like have Surah Fatiha was written down somewhere. Surah Baqarah was written down somewhere, and they just went out and they got it and went. Okay, now we just put it all together. I don't think that's what happened. The the, the narration seems to be suggesting quite heavily that actually no, it was both, and that would explain why he said he was looking for the last Surah of Surah Tauba, and he said he only found it with one person. Right? It's presumably that's his testimony. Unless it's one ayah, it's only one ayah, only one sign, one statement. It's, it's, only, one, yeah. it's, only, one, it's yeah. only one ayah, but... Yeah, but everybody knew it, the memorizers him. knew it, but it was not written except in the presence of one person. That's the issue. But it never says written. No, there it is... Says, only, it says no, 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 he no, was no. looking for... Hmm. No, 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 no. It, everybody knew this ayah, but it did, the parchment did not qualify the uh, the um, the uh, condition of having two witnesses seeing it written in the presence of the prophet only one saw it but it was uh, the whole me? quran was memorized Sh sure and i think that's what they relied on i don't think they relied on written down uh copies of the uh, or just the individual parts of the quran i don't think they did that i don't think they, they had all both. of the quran in that way they did both Can to you be very accurate that you, you talk about these two these two witnesses. I fully accept that's, that's a tradition, but it, does that tradition say that this is to do with written? Or is this just uh, validating someone's testimony? As in, we asked someone about it, and then we got two other people to validate what they said. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure it's based on what they said. In it, or it, it makes no distinction at all and doesn't say. But I'm pretty sure it doesn't say written. No, if you can show me that, I'll, I'll put my hands like up and evidence, say I'm wrong. It's like evidence in court. There must be a witness who says, yes, this was confiscated in the place where the crime was committed. There must be a witness to say this was written in the present, right. but not, not confirm what's in it. What's in it is confirmed but, by the memorizers, and all of them, many of them were memorizers. But in that same analogy, you can have two people give testimony about someone's witness. You, you, so if someone says, I saw John, and two people can be like, yes, yes, John was there, and confirm it. That has nothing to do with written texts. <clears throat> 
So if you can show me it's about written text, I'll take it back. But as far as I'm aware, it isn't about written text. Okay. We, um, gonna... But anyway, you said you wanted to ask me a question. Yes. Uh, you know, in the beginning, you you agreed with me on some attributes of God. Yeah. That being sure. the all powerful, yeah. you agree that God is all powerful. He can do everything. God is uh, all knowing. He knows everything. That God is the great, yeah. and no one is greater than God. But I really yeah. don't know how Christians believe that, and at the same time, they believe in the um, uh, Holy Trinity, Trinity, which says that the yeah. Son is God. The Son is God, but the mm -hmm. Son also said. The Father is greater than I, so the Son cannot be God mm. because God John is greater and the Son is not going to lie. The Son also said um, in, um, in um, uh, I'll tell you, I have this because this John chapter always, 5, this, verse 30 is probably what it Yes, was. exactly. I, I can of myself do nothing. That He said that he cannot do everything except with the help of God. Also here, Uh, but out of that day and that hour, no one has knowledge, not the angels and not neither the son, but the father. Alone. It's like the son says or telling us that the father is God alone. And that's what the Quran said. They have made Allah one out of three. So we believe that that's what happened. The father is God, but the son is the messenger. And the Holy Spirit is the angel, and you guys just worship a package. And you okay, but you don't think that the thing. Father is Allah, right? No, yeah, yeah, the Father, yeah. You don't so think that Allah is a fiver? No, 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 no. We, we don't believe that he is a father in, in term of, okay. no, but you call him a father, okay, then one of them is Allah, but not the other two. That's what I mean. Of course, we are so uh, cautious of calling God a father or sons or stuff. We stay away from this because it confused people through time. But the issue here is, how come you're not the first Christian who agrees with me that God has to be all-powerful and there is nothing that he cannot do, but Jesus says that he, out of his own self, he can do nothing, and you still can call him God. Well, it's, it's quite simple, really. It's the fact that we don't think that Jesus and the Father will ever go against each other because they share one divine will. So it's impossible for Jesus to, in effect, act of his own will and do something completely against what the Father um, also wills because they share that same divine will. So that to us makes a lot of sense. Is Jesus God in flesh? Is Jesus God? Yes, he is, yes. He is the incarnate okay. word. Is, is, is Jesus truthful when he said that he does not know everything? So... What's important to understand here is when we talk about the incarnation, we talk about divinity taking on flesh. It enjoins onto itself flesh. So we believe that Jesus was the only person who had two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. Because as Christians, we believe Jesus is fully a man. We believe that everything that it, you need to be, called, to be thought of as a human person, a, a man, Jesus had, he embodied. And we also believe that he fully embodied everything that it means to be God. Namely, he embodied the divine essence. So he has two natures. Now, in the human nature, he does not know all things. And this is quite clear. There's a, there's a, a verse in Luke where it says that Jesus was increasing in wisdom. Obviously, that's not possible if there is a sense uh, in which he didn't know things. So that, again, affirms that in his humanity, he didn't know thing, certain things. But in his divinity, he did know all things. And this is affirmed by other verses. So, for example, in John chapter 16, verse 30, Right after saying that he is speaking plainly, he says he knows all things. And we can bring that up if you want. Uh, there are other verses as well. John chapter, I think it's 21. Again, he says to the disciples, actually the disciples say to him, I think it's Peter, he says, Lord, we know that you know all things. So the Bible is in the Gospels is full of verses that say Jesus knew all things. So when you go very to Mark good, 13, 32 good, and the parallel so, in, in Matthew 24, 36, mm, the, the, the question then is just for us, In the Trinity here, this yeah. son who is God is only the divine yeah. nature, but not the human one. So, say again, sorry. Do we think the son is the divine nature, not the human one? Only, but not the human. So, we, so for us, in a particular point in time, the incarnation occurred. And this is, I mean, again, you have a, the story of the virgin birth in your Quran, right? In Surah 19, Surah Amilium. Yeah, well, we think that through this, 
the eternal word, the eternal son of God, which is mentioned in John 1, incarn became incarnate into the flesh. So now Jesus of Nazareth is a fully a man, but he also embodies fully the divine essence. Perfect. So after there was a point that, before that. Yeah. After that happened, he said yeah. that he cannot do everything. And he said that the father is greater than him. So he's not the greatest. Mm. And he said, so why yeah. then are Let's people confused with that. this uh, trinity, which is unfathomable? I, I will be, I would caution you about this, because if you talk about unfathomable things, there are unfathomable things in Islam. Yes, yeah, of like, course, so no problem. I'm, I'm just talking about this. Right? So don't try to uh, absolutely fine, but by all means, by all means. Now, I could just appeal to mystery and say that actually we affirm it, but we don't say how. But like, hey, if we don't, we don't talk about the how, that would be a very similar Islamic perspective, but I don't think Christians do this, because we have ways that we can rationalize this through scholastic uh, theology. We have logic and reason, and we believe that they aren't separate from theology in certain aspects. So what we would say is that uh, God is one in essence, but he is three in relation or hypostasis or person. So yes. we, we affirm the Shema, Hero is well, Lord your God, your Lord your God is one. We affirm this is Deuteronomy 6.4 and repeated elsewhere in the Old Testament and the Torah. Yeah. We affirm this about his essence. There is only one God. If you find you will never find a Christian saying there's more than one God. That's if they say that, they're immediately out of the church. They're not a Christian if they say there is more than one God. But they will affirm Excellent. that within God, there is three relations. Yeah. Excellent. But here the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Son is not the Father, but the Son is God. The Father is God, yeah, but the, the relations Father are is distinct. not the Son, is not the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they're not they are distinct uh relations, yeah. Yeah. So in the same let me put it this way. Allah has a hand. He Allah has uh, attributes, but are those attributes Allah or are they separate from him? These own attributes. Allah is not okay, his are hand. They, are, they, are they him? His hand is no no, it's it's has it's Okay, attributes. so it, Okay, so Allah is not his hand. Yeah, of course not. Allah is he has okay, so attributes. The, his attributes right, do not so, are, are not separated from him. Let me, let me tell you how I would defend this if I was a Muslim, and then you can see the parallels that I'm making towards the Christian belief. Yeah. If I was a Muslim, I would say that Allah has these hands, he has these attributes. They are distinct but not separate. And I would say that because that's basically the position that I hold regarding the Trinity. They are distinct, so there is a real Son, there is a real Father, there is a real Holy Spirit, but they are not separate. They, do not, they, they are united in will, they are united in essence, they do not go and do their own thing. They all act in unison, which is exactly why John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and the Father are one in relation to giving out um, eternal life. So Jesus gives eternal life according to our Gospels, by the way. So from that point of view, as a Muslim, I would say the same thing about the other attributes. The only difference here between what I'm saying and what you could be saying, if you hold this view, is that I'm talking about relations or persons or hypostasis as it is in Greek, and you're talking about you're talking about attributes. That's the only difference. But we're saying the same thing about them. Ultimately, God has things, right? God has power. God has uh, knowledge, and He's you know all powerful and all knowing. Well, if He has these things, they are called, technically speaking, parts. One, there is a part of Allah that is all-knowing. There is a part of Allah that is all-powerful. Uh, all and the reason you say that it is parts is because it is distinct. You can point it out, right? In com like, so, for example, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, you, you use these names to refer to attributes, but that isn't all of Allah, right? Allah is not just mercy. Surely is also justice. Surely is also um, all-knowing. Surely is the first and the last. Surely he is the light. Surely he is so on and so forth. He's all the other attributes. But by we doing this, it, you have to accept that there are parts that here. We call it sifa that here, which means it has to be in him. He cannot be without it. Sure. So, so it's not separate from him, right? Good. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but just the like, son is exactly not the exactly father. That's separation. The right hand is not his eye. His, his speech is not his vision. His his yeah, face yeah, is not his. Yeah, yeah. These these are different attributes. Different. But are attributes. they all parts of Allah? Yes, of course. The, the issue is, yeah, the, the, these are attributes of Allah. We don't say part because we don't talk about Allah as a physical being. We don't we don't do that. 
Well, I'll well, tell you, you know, that, arts I'll, can I'll, also I'll happen you, in non-physical things as well. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth so, because I consider yeah. myself a Christian. If I want to be a Muslim, I have to be a Christian in terms of following Jesus. But as he preached, and Jesus preached clearly that he is not God in the Bible, and everything that says oh, that Jesus is God in the Bible is mm. something that needs interpretation. Like the one you mentioned, for example, I and the Father are one. Well, okay, one mm. in what? You understand? It's not. It's, it needs One interpretation. In, mm. It needs you, interpretation you, you, to, to understand it like that. I, I understand. Let me just. Oh, that. A, we have a yes. hadith that says, "Whoever uh, obeys the messenger obeys Allah." Not one Muslim says that the messenger is Allah, though it can be understood like that. Okay, so when when you talk about John ten thirty, the verse, the, the context really starts at twenty seven. In twenty seven, he says, "Eternal life." Jesus is equating the fact that the Father gives eternal life with the fact that he also gives eternal life. And then he ends it with, I and the Father are one. So the context there is giving eternal life. Now, giving eternal life is something that only Allah can do. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I need to see the... the and the, Jesus the says he's God. He says oh, wait, he I can bring it up and we go through it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, they, the Gospels are full of these things. Um, you, I mean, Jesus says you can pray to him and he answers your prayers in his name. Yeah, this is all in John. Right? John actually made Jesus ah, more divine that. than the <laughs> yeah. other three. And John, but, you know, you that see, John you, was written no. over 70 years after Jesus. Okay, but you see, I can also bring up the same point about the Quran, right? The, the Quran was only really accepted at this point in time. No, 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 don't say accepted. Um, how do I know that's a correct Quran? It's not accepted, canonized, but it was always there from day one. And it's in the Hadith. And well, it's... it's Supposedly it was, right? Like I have difficulty with that because I, I don't accept the idea of uh, isnas, the, the science of hadith, the chains of narration. I think that they're problematic. Um, oh, just oh, here's an interesting thing. You, you mentioned before, you said one of the attributes of Allah is that he's the first, he is the last, right? Yeah. Jesus says he is the first and he is the last. That's in the book of Revelation. I have to check the verse. And, and, and at the end, we, I told you, well, well, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we don't accept at the end. So my, it's, my for friend, us, the Bible is not, you, not evidence I, for I, us. I understand this. Let me, let me tell you where you're going to go. Because, because yeah. I, look, I, I go to Speaker's Corner and I debate people all the time on this. So I can yeah, tell yeah, you yeah. how this is going to play out. You're not going to be able to tell me that in the Bible or in the Gospels, Jesus is not God. There are too many things that are going to be very problematic for you. Jesus is even called God directly in John chapter 20, verse 28. So it, it's out of the question. What you're eventually going to do is you're going to have to say that the Bible has been corrupted. That's that's ultimately where the, the Muslim dialogue will go. It's um, not, like, it's not because of that. Because we also, by the way, many were called God. But you know what? Satan himself was called God in the Bible. You know what? Moses was called God in the Bible. I made you God for Pharaoh. Many were called God. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's right, I mean, but it's, it's anyway. Maybe I'm. It's I'm, a I'm sensing... I, I, I should okay. have brought this. Well, we... Yeah, that's uh, all right. I know because this this is a heavy topic and it goes many places. It's a different um... topic. We can talk about that. We can have a session for that. Actually, by the way, I would love to know what you think about it because as as much as I'm interested also in studying Islam. By the way, I'm a graduate of a Catholic school. And I studied Christianity. Oh, really? like I studied Islam, of course. And I studied Christianity cool. like I studied Islam, by the way. Yeah, but that's, I, stopped that's talking, good, you know. I stopped talking to Christians over 15. You're the first Christian I talked to since maybe uh, for, for 15 years now. First one. I stopped. Oh, wow. Yeah, I stopped. I stopped. It's like uh, time, consuming, I mean, time consuming and effort. I just focused on the Quran. And my life changed okay. since I did that. Like it's like yours is so gonna you, change. You, if you just, if you just you, approach the Quran in a certain yeah. way, it's gonna give you yeah. a lot. You know what? I want you to ponder upon the the the, the sign number twenty five or twenty six. I think twenty five of Surah Al Baqarah, where it says that it's all about the approach of the human being towards the Quran. If you approach the Quran to learn from it. It's gonna give you a lot of knowledge. If you approach the Quran to ridicule it, it's gonna, it's go, it is going to misguide you and give you a lot of things to go and ridicule. The Quran itself, as much as it can guide, it can misguide also. It all depends on the approach of the person towards the Quran. I advise you and I advise By, yeah. all our audience to approach the Quran hmm. to learn from it, and they will find a lot, a lot, a lot. Their life will change. And by the way, if anyone enters Islam, he is never going to leave the religion of Jesus. He's going to join Jesus in his religion. 
How did G Jesus uh, pray? Yeah. He went a little further and then he fell on his face and prayed. Do you know yeah. how the Arabic, the Arabic Bible translates this? The only Bible that translates it like that. And he fell on his knees and prayed. They don't say on his face. Greek, okay. English, well, French. I'm not sure what they all made it on his face. Through. Why the Arabic right. Bible made it on his knees? Hmm. Because they don't I, want I don't Arab know. Christians to know that Jesus prayed like Muslims. Okay. Okay. The problem is, is that he didn't. Uh, in John seventeen, in John seventeen, it starts off by saying that Jesus prayed standing up, looking upwards. Like and that, why? That's, that's why does it say? Story. Why the, does it say? And he fell on his knees. I mean, Jesus. Prayed. Oh, he, he may have. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you can make a case that he, he did it. Yeah, that's, but to that's say that in the, that's in the garden, in the, the, yeah, yeah, garden of Gethsemane. Right. There yeah. is a case to be made that yeah, yeah, but. To say that that's just how he prayed and he prayed like a Muslim is disingenuous because other parts of these texts say that he prayed like a Jew. Because well, Jews Jew. pray like Muslims too, by the way. The, if you look at Orthodox uh, Jews they, and how they pray, mm. oh, well, go and check it on YouTube. But, wait, wait, there's, there's, there's Orthodox Christians that, that properly prostrate. They put the, fa the face to the floor. Yeah, but they you put know, the, 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 the Bieber, they, they, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, anyway, I'm telling but, you, I'm just telling people that, guys, we are not uh, aliens. We are people who follow Jesus and love Jesus and love his mother. It's just that we don't accept elevating him above a certain level, like others are putting him down in a way that we don't also accept. So some, we are like in between two factions, Christians who made Jesus a deity and Jews who made Jesus something bad. I don't want to say what they say about him and Sammy. Hmm. So we don't accept both. I understand. I, I, that's, that's fine. I mean, I go by, um, I can use the historical critical method to evaluate what the earliest manuscripts say about Jesus. And the earliest manuscripts we have are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And technically Paul's letters. Paul's letters are actually earlier. But again, I mean, I mean, to think about this, think about this. It, does this sound genuine to you? If, if I said to you, Paul was a Muslim because he prayed with his face to the floor, would you accept that? No, no, no. It depends on, on, like, no, on his Paul, freedom. Paul. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not saying so. By mm -hmm. the way, I'm not telling Christians to become Muslim because Jesus uh, fell on his face in prayer. No, but he said, he, he, he said, uh, pray to the Father. He said, pray as you see me praying. He himself prayed. How can God pray? He cannot be a God and pray. Well, there's a lot of things here. Uh, anyway, you know what? Uh, it looks like I'm going to make a video. Mm. I, I stopped talking about Christianity, but it looks like because of you, only for you, for your eyes only, I'm going <laughs> to make a video Yeah, that will convince you to take Shahada online with me one day. Well, I hope one day. Oh, did you say that you, you, you said you went to a, a Catholic school? Were you Christian at some point? Or... No, 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 no. So were, you, no, no. You, you always been a Muslim? No, no, no. Half of the students or more were, were Muslims. In Egypt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, Catholic, Catholic, not Orthodox, because most of the Egyptian Christians are Orthodox. But that was a Catholic mm. one. Yeah, they would be Coptic Orthodox. Yeah. I, th I think that's. Yeah, that's but those were Coptic Egypt. Catholics. And I'm a Coptic Muslim, by the way. The word Copt does not mean Christian. The word Copt means Egypt, 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 Al Copt. So Copt means uh, it's from Egypt. You know what? Even uh, Moses talked the Coptic language. That was like how many years before Jesus was born? A lot, uh, centuries, right? So the word Copt means Egyptian. Egypt, yeah, Egypt. Sense. Yeah, yeah. So I have a book, by the way. Yeah, I, it, I have a book. Hmm. I have a book called Coptic Muslims Before Muhammad. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Coptic Muslims, Aqbat uh, Muslimun Qabla Muhammad. And it was the best seller in Egypt in 2010 in the uh, book fair and it's not uh, yet in I, I I'm thinking of like uh, translating it to English but I have it on a video I I'm explaining because my master's thesis was about Arianism mm. I proved oh really that, oh. yes I mm. proved that Arianism is Islam before the birth of Prophet Muhammad and I okay. proved that it is the untold history of the world. And if you don't understand Arianism, there's a lot of things in history that you will not understand about the Roman Byzantines, about Islam itself. Uh, things even in the seerah of Prophet Muhammad itself, you will not understand why did he want peace with Quraysh that much? Yeah, because he was a man of peace. No. 
as soon as he made peace truce with Quraysh, he sent four armies to the north. It's not because he wanted uh, to make a truce and to make sure that the southern front is safe because he's going to fight the strongest country in the world, the Roman Byzantine. Why is that? Because at that time, they were killing the Aryans like goats. The books of history say that 500 Egyptian Aryans joined the army of Amr ibn al-As in conquering Egypt. Egyptian are, yani it's like about one over six of the army of Amr ibn al-As were, were Aryans, Egyptian Aryans. It's, it's mind-blowing. Aryanism is a history that needs to be understood because they were vilified. The only thing I have to... The only thing I have to add to this is Arianism will not be compatible with Islam. Arianism would still affirm things that would be pragmatic to the Islamic doctrine. Uh, you, you could, as long as you get that, that that's fine. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't get that. No, no, no. My well, masters, yeah. my masters is proving that this is not true because everything written about Arius was written by his enemies, and the enemy, actually, no, the conqueror, writes. History. So he writes himself orthodox, and he writes the other as right. a heretic. But maybe the truth. Well, you got to be that... careful. You you got to be careful there, though, because Islam also writes a lot of what we know about the Jalalian period, right? The period of ignorance. Uh, there are very few resources that survive from that. It's actually Islamic writers that tell us about it. So, you know, you got to be careful because there has to be some sense of objectivity, and I think there is. I think that uh, Arius's um, ideology was well understood because it persisted for quite a long time. It was a heretical aspect of the church. So we know yeah. what they believed and we know that people, because we have letters of people arguing, bishops from the church writing to, to other people who were, who were heretical, who were Arians and saying, you think X, Y, and Z, this is wrong because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, but again, ultimately, master, so for example... My master's um, thesis proved that everything heretical about Arius came from Athanasius book and from others who were against him. But things that are bits from here and there, you find that Arius' creed is very, very similar to Islam. The problem is you cannot get his creed except from the students of Arius who will show you. The I'll tell you something. Look at the Unitarians today. And we all know that the Unitarian church is like the descendants, the spiritual descendants of the Arians. The Unitarian, they don't believe. They believe in Jesus oh, as a teacher, fully. Yeah, you can you can make a claim for that, sure. Excellent. But Ari Excellent. Arians, Arians. Okay, so so you know that the, the, the Council of Nicaea, right? This is where Arius was brought to to defend his position. And yes. there were th according to our our history, there were three hundred eighteen bishops that were present there. Three hundred sixteen condemned Arius. No, don't condemn. So, so you're talking they like voted. nine more than ninety. Yeah, they voted over they ninety percent. Said that Arius' beliefs about the the fact that the the sun was not eternal. Among he them was, are Arians because they were afraid because at that time there was a lot of violence, and they said a little bit of ink in a signature is much it's much better than my own blood. Among the people who voted against Arianism is. Uh, 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 what's his name? The Bishop of Nicomedia, who is the famous Arian whom, who baptized uh, Constantine on the Arian Creed. Mm. So he was Arian and said mm. he voted like that because he was afraid. Anyway, anyway, we're, let, we're, now, well, we're now confusing okay. well, the audience. We, sure. We're not confusing the sure. audience and it's time for Tahor. People who will not eat now are not going to eat for 48 hours. So we have to end somehow, somewhere. So do you have anything else to say? Sure. Um, I guess I guess we could just summarize, you know, and, and call it a day. I'm more than happy to do another live stream. Um, you know, about maybe we can get together also after Ramadan and uh, and uh, have a coffee, and then we can also do more, inshallah, if, if we want. Yeah, we sure. just we yeah. just need um, people to know that you can differ with each other in a friendly atmosphere. You didn't. You don't need to shout at each other. At the end, God, Allah, will judge between us on Judgment Day. We can differ and have a coffee. You understand me? We don't have to agree at the yeah. end. Of course, I love, I, I would love that agree, you yeah. become Muslim and you would love if I become Christian. This is definitely Amen. okay. But but what exactly is going to happen? That's in Allah's knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, again, I think this has been a really fruitful chat. I think that a lot has been affirmed here. I think a lot that many Muslims may not be familiar with. Um, my real central point of difference here is I think it's difficult to establish that Muhammad said that these killer arts would be 10. I don't think we can relate that back to Muhammad. I think that's an issue. 
I think that killer ads is more likely better explained as just variations that have been caused by ever so slight diacritical changes in the Arabic. And when you showed the Arabic, I think that was quite clear how easy it would be to make these kind of variations. And yet, they still even the, the meaning may be quite different, but it's still quite quite easy to see how uh, that could be an accepted uh, reading. Um, we don't have any real backing from Muhammad that says there should be seven of these or 10 of these or 14 of these or however many. So just accept these as authentic Quran, I think is not based in the Sunnah. And I, I would say it's a bit that it's a, in, in an invasion. Um, but maybe we, you can go when you can find some stuff. Maybe I've missed the Sunnah. Maybe I've missed something. This is, you this can, is you your can bring belief. That and my belief is completely opposite to this. The Quran is fully preserved. All the Qiraat are from Prophet Muhammad. We have it by a chain of narration. And at the same time, it's mentioned in the Hadith, like the Hadith I mentioned of Lady Aisha, in which she said, I heard the Prophet reciting Farouhun wa Raihan, Faruhun wa Raihan, and many others, by the way. So there is, in the books of the Sunnah, there is a chapter for the Qiraat, called Qiraat, by the way, uh, and so on. So anyway... Thank you very much, Chris. And I would love to thank it was a pleasure the audience, to you. whether they came from my side or from your side. I just want you not to stop fighting with each other, shouting at each other. We can be friends and we can have a civilized talk discussing Aqidah out of love for each other, by the way. By the way. And thank you very much. Take care. Absolutely. God bless Bye. you all. Bye. Thank you.